Today, we're taking a look at Britain's most evil mom, Eunice Spry. A mom is supposed to be loving, supportive, warm, and kind. Eunice Spry is none of those things. Eunice Spry, a British woman from Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire, UK, ran a foster home for children out of her home. And she welcomed kids into her home, promising them a safe space to grow up. However, these kids were anything but safe under Eunice's care. And to the outside world, Eunice presented herself as a pillar of the community. I mean, running a foster care program, you usually associate that with being a good person. But for this story, that is certainly not the case. Eunice Spry was just straight up evil, the worst possible person to care for a child. Eunice was officially approved as a foster carer in 1984. She had a biological daughter named Judith Spry and an adopted daughter named Charlotte Spry living at home with her. Eventually, more kids were added into the home. Victoria Evans, Aloma Gilbert, and Christopher Spry were toddlers in need of a home, which Eunice gladly provided. Unfortunately, once Eunice had these young children in her home, she started to abuse them right away. She would beat them with sticks, force them to eat pet food, stand in time out in the corner for hours and scrub their skin with sandpaper. Myself and Victoria were locked in a room and fed only once every seven to eight days. We were in real trouble, given water every two days. Uh, we were basically naked in a room and we ate rat droppings of all sorts in that room to try and stay alive. It was, it was horrific. The kids were often battered and attacked with hot pokers, machetes, and cricket bats, and had their heads held under water. And the abuse just keeps getting worse. When the kids would cry, as punishment, she would shove sticks down their throats, making it really painful for them to swallow for days and days. You know, she'd step on our throat, because remember, we're led down, she'd beat in the top of our feet, she would step on our throats. She... To her, us screaming while being beaten was disrespecting her. At school, the teachers kind of suspected something was wrong, and they would ask the kids, you know, what's wrong? But the kids were instructed to tell them everything was completely fine and everything at home was great. Eunice was obsessed with being perfect and appearing perfect to the outside world, so she made sure that none of these kids would raise any flags or say a word about the abuse to anyone. After a while, Eunice decided to move the whole family to a little farm near the village of Eckington. Here, she had even more privacy to do whatever horrible things she wanted to these kids. We got beaten once we got to the farmhouse. We'd get beaten daily. And it was mostly with bamboo poles, with chair legs, with pieces of metal sometimes. But the one day Eunice was using a offcut of wood from where we were restoring the farmhouse. There were offcuts everywhere. And it had a nail in it. And I don't think she knew it had a nail in it. But she whipped it across the front of my leg and the nail pierced my kneecap and went into my kneecap and got stuck. This farm in Eckington was in terrible condition. The place was in shambles and really not a good place for children to be running around. Basic amenities were either not connected or they were selectively put in places where only the children Spry favored would have access to them. Once they moved to the farm, the kids stopped attending school. Instead, they would spend all day at home with Eunice. Eunice was starving these foster children. She was not giving them access to running water and not giving them access to electricity, so they couldn't get clean and couldn't stay warm. Just basic human necessities. If the kids did actually manage to find scrap food to eat and they got caught, they would be punished. For example, one of the kids, Christopher, at age 10, was punished by having his feet tied to the back of Eunice's van and then dragged behind it while Eunice drove all around the field by their home. The crazy thing is Eunice didn't abuse all of the kids. She didn't touch her own children. Her biological daughter, Judith, and her adopted daughter, Charlotte, were left completely fine. She didn't do any harm to them at all. Actually, it's said that they were treated quite well by Eunice, but it seems that Eunice only tortured and abused the foster kids. In her eyes, she saw them as children of the devil. She felt that the foster kids deserved everything she gave them. And although Judith and Charlotte did not personally receive any physical abuse, they did, however, play a role in the other children's abuse. 
Eunice would force Judith and Charlotte to make violent acts against the other children. She would shout out instructions and tell them exactly what to do. For example, Eunice would force the kids to lay down. She would have Judith and Charlotte stand on their foster siblings' windpipes to stop them from screaming while they whipped the bottom of their feet with sticks. I mean, this is just really awful, appalling things. So really, Judith and Charlotte might not have received physical abuse, but this is definitely a form of psychological abuse. Then one day, Judith, Charlotte, and Victoria Evans were in a horrible accident. They were all together traveling in a car when another vehicle crashed into them. The driver that crashed into them apparently was not paying attention to the road, but was changing the radio station at the time of the crash. Unfortunately, 16-year-old Charlotte and 27-year-old Judith passed away pretty much immediately from this accident. And she just very blankly looked at us and said, Judith and Charlotte are dead. And of course, we are instant tears, you know. These are our siblings, whether you know, we like them, you know, they were untouched and stuff, but they're still our siblings. And, and she just looked at us and said, and I wish it had been you. I went through emotions of wanting to commit suicide at age 12. I can't forgive her for that. I really can't forgive her for that. Now, Victoria managed to survive, but was badly injured. She had broken her neck and pelvis and had multiple fractures to her arms and legs. She was taken to the hospital and spent several months in the intensive care unit. At the hospital, Victoria was induced into a coma for months. While Victoria was in the hospital, Eunice would go and visit her. When Victoria eventually woke up, Eunice told her that the crash was all Victoria's fault. At the hospital, Eunice would threaten Victoria and tell her not to speak a word about the abuse going on back home. Eunice told Victoria that she had survived the crash, unlike Judith and Charlotte, because Victoria was a child of the devil and that the devil looks after his own. Eunice even denied Victoria physiotherapy, which she desperately needed. Without this treatment, the doctor said that Victoria would need to be in a wheelchair for a few months while she built up her strength. But Eunice forced Victoria to stay in the wheelchair well after three months. If Victoria tried to get out of the wheelchair, Eunice would then beat her. Plus, this was an opportunity for Eunice. You see, the longer Victoria remained in that wheelchair, the longer Eunice could collect benefit money for her. So having Victoria in a wheelchair put money in Eunice's pocket. Victoria was in that wheelchair for three years. It just makes me sick to think about what these kids went through and they were forced to keep quiet about it for so long. There are so many child abuse cases that go unreported all around the world and it's just really heartbreaking. I found a study by the NSPCC that spoke with almost 4,000 children and indicates 7% of secondary school age children report being abused at home, including being hit, kicked, beaten, or attacked with a weapon by an adult. And over half of these adults were the child's own parents. I mean, think about that for a second. That's a really high percentage. And maybe some of these kids are too afraid to speak up and tell the truth, so the real percentage could even be higher. In 2005, Victoria finally spoke out about the time she had spent with Eunice and what really went on behind those closed doors. She confided in a close friend and revealed all of the horror stories she'd experienced. Her friend then persuaded her to take the matter to police. Other foster children that had been in Eunice's care, Christopher and Aloma, had also agreed to testify against Eunice in court. Finally, in April of 2007, Eunice, at 62 years old, was sentenced to 14 years in prison for unlawful wounding, cruelty to a person under 16, assault occasioning actual bodily harm, perverting the course of justice, and witness intimidation. The offenses took place in two of Spry's home in Gloucestershire between 1986 and all the way up until 2005. Eunice had racked up 26 charges of child abuse. And that's only sentenced to 14 years? I mean, that's nowhere near enough time. This woman was horrible and deserves a much harsher sentence than that. And if that's not bad enough, throughout the entire trial, Eunice played totally innocent. Yeah, that's right. She claimed she was on the up and up and simply raising the kids in line with Christian values. She claimed that the only physical punishment that she ever used was a smack on the bottom. At the trial, the judge for this case, Judge Simon Darwell Smith, told Eunice that this was the worst case in his 40 years practicing law. Judge Darwell Smith also said, 
It's difficult for anyone to understand how any human being could have even contemplated what you did, let alone with the regularity and premeditation you employed. The judge also told Eunice at the trial, I could not fail to notice that during the five and a half weeks of this trial, you showed no emotion, even when the jury returned the guilty verdicts. In September 2008, Spry's sentence was reduced by the High Court to 12 years. She was released from prison in 2014, which means she only served seven years and two months of her sentence. After all of that, after 17 years of torture, these foster kids were finally free from Eunice's wicked grasp. Silenced for far too long, the children under Eunice's care, now as adults, decided to share their stories with the world. Eunice's oldest foster son, Christopher Spry, nicknamed Child C, published a book of the same name about his childhood living with Eunice Spry. The book is titled Child C, Surviving a Foster Mother's Reign of Terror. Eunice's foster daughter, Aloma Gilbert, also wrote and shared a book about what she'd endured. She published Deliver Me From Evil. Eunice's foster child, Victoria, also went on to write a book about her tragic experience living with Eunice. The book is titled Tortured. The book was very successful, so successful that it was translated into three different languages to be shared with more people. Victoria said that this book is the side of the story I always wanted to tell. Victoria later went on to work with social workers to help them spot the signs of abuse. She wanted to do something positive to help and protect children. But it pains me to say that Victoria ultimately ended her life early in her flat in Cheltenham on September 22nd, 2020. Just two weeks before her death, she was discharged from a psychiatric hospital after six months of treatment. Christopher, Victoria's brother, said Victoria wanted to be remembered for her mission to help children. He's quoted as saying, the work she was doing with Gloucestershire Safeguarding Board and Social Services was because she wanted ours to be the last horror case for Gloucestershire. I think her legacy will be the work she was doing to help the next wave of our social workers spot cases like ours early on. Childhood abuse and neglect cases are serious public health problems, and adverse childhood experiences can have long-term impacts on health, opportunity, and well-being. It's absolutely horrible what those kids went through living with Eunice. No child should ever feel unsafe in their home. It absolutely just breaks my heart. And it's difficult to tell you this story as I'm sure it's difficult to hear as well. So hug your loved ones extra tight tonight and please stay safe out there. I'm Jason and thanks for watching another dark episode of Killer Bites. I'll see you next time. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the Oakland County child killer. People who kill other people are terrible, but people who kill children, they're an entirely different breed. For 13 months between 1976 and 1977, four innocent little kids from the same county of Michigan were abducted, held captive for several days, and slain. Leading up to their demise, the kids were well-groomed and fed, but somewhere along the way, a switch flipped and their abductor unleashed. On February 15th, 1976, 12-year-old Mark Stebbins called his mom to tell her he was heading home from the American Legion Hall. As the sun started setting, Mark's mom grew more concerned. Mark literally called her a few hours ago and it's not a long walk back home. By 11 p.m., Mark's mom had enough of the waiting and panicking and called 911 to report her son missing. The police weren't able to find Mark that night, or the next day, or the next. And I'm sure you know this, but in missing persons cases, it's always harder to solve them the more time that passes. By February 19th, it had already been about four days and things weren't looking too good. At 11.45 that morning, a businessman left his office building to go on a walk. He was headed for the drugstore, but along the way, he saw what looked like a mannequin wearing jeans and a blue jacket on a snowbank in the parking lot. He thought it was strange and walked over there to check it out. As he got closer, the man realized it wasn't a mannequin. It was the corpse of a young boy. Stunned, the man called the police, and soon enough, officers arrived and identified the boy as Mark Stebbins. He was still wearing the outfit he disappeared in and was placed very neatly on the snow. After conducting the initial crime scene investigation, the authorities sent Mark's body off for an autopsy while they tried to see if there were any witnesses who could give them any clues as to what happened and who did this. There was someone who said they walked their dog in that parking lot around 9.30 a.m. and didn't see Mark's body. The dog owner said their dog was on a super long leash and definitely would have sniffed out the boy's body if it were there. This led investigators to believe that Mark's body must have been dumped in the parking lot sometime after the dog walk at 9.30 and before the businessman found it at 11.45. That's only a two hour and 15 minute window. 
In the autopsy, medical examiners noted two slash marks through the back left portion of Mark's head. They also noticed severe rope marks on his wrists and ankles, which led them to believe Mark was tied up the whole time he was being attacked. Based on other evidence, examiners determined Mark was physically violated with an object and asphyxiated, which ultimately caused his demise. With this information, investigators hoped to identify the perp, but they were unsuccessful. And it didn't help that the medical examiners washed Mark's body, which meant they got rid of any potential fingerprints. Isn't that something the investigators and examiners should have discussed before the autopsy? Makes you wonder how many times something like that has happened in other cases. Even still, no one knew who could do something so terrible to Mark, but it wouldn't be too long until a similar crime happened in the same county. Just a few days before Christmas in 1976, a 12-year-old girl named Jill Robinson got into a fight with her mom, Carol. They argued pretty frequently, as most preteens and their parents do. The topic on this particular night was biscuits. Carol asked Jill to help her make biscuits for dinner, and Jill said no. And back in 1976, if you told your mom no at 12 years old, or at any age for that matter, you were about to be in for a rude awakening. Carol told Jill to leave her house until she wanted to be a part of the family. She was obviously over-exaggerating, but Jill did just as her mom said. When tensions are high like this, it's always a game of who's gonna break first. Carol honestly didn't want Jill leaving, and I don't think Jill really wanted to leave either, but they were both just really stubborn. Jill went to a room and got dressed in jeans, a shirt, a big orange jacket, and a blue knitted hat. She shoved some clothes and a plaid blanket into a denim bag and headed out the door. Jill then hopped on her bike and rode off, never to come home again. That night, a family friend spotted Jill outside of a hobby shop near Carol's home. Sometime between 6 and 7 the following morning, Jill was seen at the Donut Depot on Maple Road. It's honestly pretty crazy to me that neither Jill nor Carol broke by then. Like, if I ran away as a kid like that, I probably would have lasted maybe 30 minutes. I would have packed maybe one Pop-Tart, eaten it immediately, and then gotten hungry. After the early morning sighting, Jill wasn't seen again. Or, at least alive. Jill's parents were divorced, and her dad already called the police the night Jill left her mom's house. It's not clear, but I'm guessing Carol may have called her ex to tell him what happened, thinking Jill would ride over to his house. Anyway, the police had been informed of the incident and had their eyes peeled for Jill, although it seemed like a clear runaway case where the kid would return home soon enough. But the day after Jill left, her bike was found abandoned by the hobby shop. You'd think she'd be nearby, but that wasn't the case. Days passed, and Jill's family and friends grew even more concerned. Where was she? On December 26, Jill was found on the side of Interstate 75 in Troy, Michigan. She was precisely placed on her back on a bed of snow with her clothes and backpack still on. About half of her face had been obliterated by a 12-gauge firearm, so it was quite a horrific scene. And the specific location of her body was very visible from the police station, so it was almost like someone wanted her to be found that way. Medical examiners performed an autopsy on Jill where they found no signs of violation. They also determined her body was so clean the perp must have washed it, and she had been fed for the past three days. That's so sad and crazy to think that someone can care for a child for three days and then just suddenly pull the trigger on them. And how creepily similar were Jill and Mark's cases? They were both found neatly placed on a bed of snow out in the open, they both still had their clothes on, and they were both preteens who lived in the same area with divorced parents. Reports also describe Jill and Mark as quiet and smart loners. So they had to have been executed by the same person, right? On January 2nd, 1977, 10-year-old Christine Mihalik was reported missing by her mother, Deborah. Christine was last seen a few hours earlier buying a magazine at a 7-Eleven in Berkeley, Michigan. Shortly after Deborah reported Christine as missing, a search began. But things weren't looking too promising. At this point, people in town were already speculating that there was a serial killer on the loose who was targeting young children. And Christine was just this mystery criminal's type. She was young, smart, shy, and came from divorced parents. As much as it seemed like Christine was abducted by the same person who went after Jill and Mark, Deborah hoped that wasn't the case. A few days into the search, Deborah said, People keep talking about the Royal Oak Girl, Jill Robinson, but I'm just not even going to think about that. I guess that's a good mindset to have. It's always helpful to hope for the best, but I sure hope Deborah prepared for the worst because that's just what she was about to get hit with. On January 21st, a mail carrier was going about their normal route when they noticed something on the side of the road. Squinting a little bit, the mail carrier was like, is that a hand? I'm sure you've guessed it by now, but the mail carrier was looking at Christine's lifeless body. Her corpse was placed in plain view of a neighborhood on a bed of snow at the end of a dead-end road. Her arms were crossed and her eyes were closed like she was staged for a formal funeral. Given the fact that it was January, the conditions were not favorable for this discovery. Christine's corpse was not only on a bank of snow, but it was so badly frozen that examiners had to wait a full day until they could perform an autopsy. 
When they did, they concluded Christine was off less than a day before she was discovered. To throw some numbers out there, she had been missing for 19 days. That meant whoever took Christine held her captive for around 18 days before smothering her. Shortly after Christine's disappearance and before her discovery, another little kid from her school went missing and people absolutely panicked. This was getting out of hand. Thankfully, the kid was found about 20 minutes later untouched, but by then parents started really buckling down on how much they monitored their kids. Kids used to be able to walk to and from school, ride their bikes around the neighborhood, and go on errands for their families. Now parents were directly picking their kids up from school, limiting their time outside, and accompanying them pretty much everywhere. But there would be one more case allegedly performed by the same guy who was dubbed the Babysitter Killer, or Oakland County Child Killer. On March 16th, 11-year-old Timothy King borrowed 30 cents from his older sister so he could buy candy at the drugstore. He grabbed his football, hopped on his skateboard, and rushed over to Hunter Maple Pharmacy to get something sweet. At the time, Timothy's parents were out at dinner and his two older brothers were busy. His older sister Catherine also had plans later that night, so this was technically Timothy's first time being home alone. At 9 p.m., Timothy's parents came home and noticed the door was cracked open. When they got inside, their hearts dropped. Timothy was nowhere to be found. The Kings contacted friends and family members to see if they knew anything, but no one did. People searched the neighborhood that night, and by the following morning, a full-on task force had been formed to help find the missing little boy. Investigators spoke with the employee who helped Timothy at the drugstore, and she said that after Timothy purchased this candy, he walked out of the back door and into the parking lot. This was around 8.30 p.m. After that, it was like he vanished into the parking lot, or was abducted. Timothy's dad begged in a TV interview for his son to be returned, and Timothy's mom wrote in a newspaper that she hoped Timothy would come back so he could eat his favorite meal from KFC. They were trying everything they could to lure their son back to them. On March 22nd, two teenagers found Timothy's remains in a shallow ditch. He was still wearing his clothing, but it looked like they'd been washed and pressed, and his skateboard was right beside him. Coroners concluded Timothy was physically violated with an object much like Mark, and his COD was asphyxiation. In the autopsy, medical examiners theorized Timothy had only been lifeless for about six hours, and he still had traces of food from KFC in his stomach. With the findings from this case, detectives knew it was time to get cracking on the suspect list. All four of these cases were linked together based on location and MO. The police were looking for someone who targeted young children in Oakland County. Whoever this was had some sick obsession with taking care of kids before brutally executing them. The perp had a stronger infatuation with boys and also had to seem fairly trustworthy for kids to talk to them like that. Over time, a witness came forward. She said she saw Timothy talking to a man in the parking lot on the night he vanished. He was described as a 25 to 35 year old white man with dark brown hair and a shag style with mutton chop sideburns. He was in a late model blue AMC Gremlin with a white stripe on the side. The witness worked with an artist to create a sketch of the perp that was blasted out to the public as well as a photo of a blue AMC Gremlin. Investigators looked up all the Gremlin owners in Oakland County and questioned each and every one of them. Okay, whose idea was it to name a car model after a mythical creature? Because I kind of love it, but I also kind of hate it. Anyway, there were no leads with the Gremlin owner interview, but there were thousands of tips coming in for the police to sort through. Several arrests were made from the tips, but they were from completely unrelated cases. So there was a Detroit-based psychiatrist named Bruce who was working on the case, and a few weeks after Timothy's discovery, Bruce got a letter. It was full of typos and grammatical errors, but basically this person called themselves Alan and said their roommate Frank was the criminal they were looking for. Alan said he was forced to accompany Frank on many excursions to see young boys, but claimed he was never there for any of the abductions or executions. He was also like, oh yeah, Frank drove an AMC Gremlin, but just got rid of it in Ohio. According to Alan, Frank had PTSD after having to slay young kids in the Vietnam War, and the reason he committed these crimes was because he wanted to seek revenge against the wealthy people who sent off others to fight in the war. Wait, his revenge for having to slay children in the war was going on and slaying more children in the civilian world? Does that add up for any of y'all? Because it doesn't for me. In the letter, Alan expressed how threatened he felt by Frank. He feared for his life and even thought about ending it. That's how bad his roommate was. Being a mental health professional, Bruce didn't take those claims lightly. He took the letter very seriously and wanted to find the mysterious author. Sometime after that, Bruce got a phone call from this Allen guy. He said he'd provide photo evidence of Frank in exchange for a letter from the governor that granted him immunity from being prosecuted. Oh no, don't tell me this was all a scam. Bruce kept talking to Alan and the two decided to meet up at this local bar, but of course, Alan didn't show up and never made a peep ever again. It was pretty clear Alan was just a random criminal looking to get away with whatever they did, so it was back to the suspect list drawing board. 
Several suspects have been theorized, but to this day, no one has been arrested for any of these crimes. The main perps believed to have committed these four slayings include John Wayne Gacy, the famous killer clown who took out several children, but he was later ruled out after a few DNA tests were run. Archibald Edward Sloan, a known offender who often targeted young boys in his neighborhood. Hair strands that matched samples found at two of the four crime scenes were recovered from Archibald's car, but they weren't a match for Archibald's. It's believed that he let his other pedo friends borrow his car fairly often. Theodore Lamborghini, or Ted, was another top suspect. Instead of agreeing to take a polygraph test for this case, Ted decided to plead guilty to 15 other counts that involved harming young boys. And when he was presented the opportunity to have his sentence reduced in exchange for a polygraph test, he declined. Most people believe Ted is the one who did it for obvious reasons. I mean, when you decide to plead guilty 15 times before answering a few questions about another case, it looks pretty bad, just saying. But most recently, there's been another suspect, Chris Bush. Before Timothy's abduction, Chris was in custody for charges relating to explicit photos of children, so he definitely had the motive and experience. In 1978, Chris had taken his own life, and that would match up with the timeline of when these crimes stopped happening. Chris passed away from a bullet wound between the eyes, and while the authorities said it was a self-inflicted act, there was no firearm residue or fluid spatter. There were four shells found in his room, and he was lying neatly under his sheets. During the search, officers found a drawing of a boy that looked a lot like Mark. So Timothy's dad and uncle found out about this Chris dude and demanded more answers. The state police passed over their investigative records, and as of now, that's all we know. It sounds to me like Chris's demise could have been staged though. Maybe the real babysitter killer offed Chris and framed him for the crimes. That way, the real perp could live out the rest of his life a free man. I just find it hard to believe that someone would be able to pull the trigger on themselves at such a close range and tuck themselves in bed after that. What do you think? In today's episode, I'm gonna tell you what happened to Michael and Thelma King one night in St. Martin. Being a criminal isn't for everyone. Well, technically it shouldn't be for anyone, but some people are especially bad at it. The perps we're talking about today decided to rob this couple's condo while they were home, but didn't even come up with a game plan. The men ended up executing the two people inside and just two days after the bodies were discovered, the first criminal was already in handcuffs. So Michael and Thelma King were two restaurateurs in their 50s who lived in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. But they also had a condo at the Ocean Club Resort in Cubico Bay, St. Martin, where they lived for several months out of the year. In St. Martin, Michael and Thelma found this spot called Topper's Restaurant and Bar. They absolutely loved the food and rum and became close friends with the owner Topper Dabble as well as his wife Melanie. Being a wealthy investor who saw potential in Topper and Melanie's rum, Michael decided to go into business with the couple. Together, they founded a startup rum company and began building the blueprints for a distillery. They had their sights set on distributing the beverage in the United States and eventually the entire world. Honestly, selling alcohol is one of the best businesses you can get into. Like, there's always a demand and it's pretty much foolproof. And I feel like it has to be fun to work at a distillery, right? Anyway, things were going really well for the Kings. They were pretty much at the point of retirement, aside from the rum business, which was more a play than it was work. Michael used to be an insurance executive, so he had a lot of money to spend on him and his wife, and I'm sure it was amazing to live on a tropical island. But in September of 2012, their lives were about to be cut short. On the 21st, Michael's nephew got a call from someone in St. Martin who asked if he knew Michael or Michael's brother Todd, AKA his dad. The nephew immediately called his dad Todd to pass the message along. Todd was super confused, but called the dude in St. Martin and found out that he was a police officer. The officer told Todd that he was working on a car theft case and found his brother Michael's credit card and cell phone. He said he was just going through Michael's contact list, calling around to see if anyone knew why his belongings were in that car. And while it seemed like Michael was a criminal, the police were actually about to find out that he was the victim of a very heinous crime. Here's what happened. On September 19th, Michael was having a cozy night in, sitting in the recliner and watching TV. As he was dozing off, three intoxicated young men walked by his and Thelma's condo and were all like, yo, I bet some rich people live in there. Let's hit it and see what they've got. The three men noticed that there were some lights on inside and a few windows open, meaning people were probably home, so they had to be quick and assertive. As swiftly and quietly as possible, the three robbers snuck into Michael and Thelma's balcony and twisted the door handle. It was unlocked. As they slowly made their way into the condo, the trio noticed the sleeping man in the recliner and decided to approach him. They tiptoed their way to the living room until they were standing right in front of Michael. One of them pulled out a firearm and touched the barrel to Michael's head. That's what finally woke Michael up, the cold touch of the pistol. How terrifying is that? 
Well, by the end of the robber's visit, they had a bunch of cash in their pockets and Michael and Thelma's lives were over. I'll go over the details of what exactly happened a little later. So it wasn't until two days later when the authorities found Michael and Thelma. In addition to the officers discovering Michael's things in the stolen car, a handful of the couple's friends went to the police in concern after not hearing from them for a few days. Topper last saw Michael on Wednesday the 19th. They were hanging out and having drinks with a few other friends. But the next day, Michael wasn't answering any of Topper's phone calls. So when Friday rolled around and still no word from Michael, Topper decided to stop by his condo. He banged on the door, but no one opened it. This spurred him to ask someone at the condo to jump the fence and let him know if they could see anyone inside. Apparently, the person came back and told Topper that they saw a corpse leaning over a chair. So it was time for a welfare check. When the police entered the King's condo, they found Thelma tied to a chair and Michael leaning over another chair on the floor in red fluid. In the words of St. Martin's Solicitor General, it was an ugly scene. You know, it's stories like these that make me grateful I never became a detective. Don't get me wrong, I love talking about true crime, but I feel like actually being there at the scene has to be super tough. So based on the way everything looked, the police theorized the slangs were a result of a robbery gone wrong. They could tell some things were missing from the condo, but weren't able to find any signs of forced entry. After the initial crime scene investigation, Michael and Thelma's bodies were sent off for examination, and the results confirmed what we already knew, that this was a gruesome crime committed by terrible people. When the news got out about the discovery, the whole town of St. Martin was absolutely shocked. Not only was the area known for being safe, but Michael and Thelma were two of the nicest people ever. One of the King's old friends said they were the greatest people in the world. Michael would give you this shirt off of his back. Topper commented, they were beautiful people. They were kind to everybody. So who would want to hurt them? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the detectives had a hunch the crime was a robbery gone wrong, which means the criminals probably didn't go after Michael or Thelma for their character or personality. They most likely executed the couple because they were either hesitant to hand over their money or the perps just didn't want them to go tattle on them after the fact. Before the weekend was over, the police had their first suspect arrested. It's not clear why they thought he was responsible or how they tracked him down, but I'm just happy they already had a suspect in custody. Dang. The St. Martin cops are out here making money moves. So the suspect was a 28 year old Jamaican native named May Shane Johnson who was living on the island illegally. Ironically enough, he worked a job as a security guard. Security guard by day, robber by night. What a contrast. In an official statement, the Solicitor General said, we have to keep some things in confidence so as to not jeopardize the investigation, but we have a definite link between our suspect and the case. We are pretty confident the judge will see it that way too and he will be kept incarcerated. He didn't share any additional details, but the prosecutor's office said May Shane heavily resisted his arrest. He put up such a fight that he and one police officer suffered injuries and had to go to the hospital. After May Shane's wounds were tended to, he was sent straight to the police station. In his first few interviews, he denied any involvement. But by the beginning of October, May Shane had confessed to his part in the crime. And he didn't act alone. There were two other suspects in custody that the authorities thought were involved as well. 18-year-old Jeremiah Mills and 21-year-old Jamal Wolford. Over time, the detectives and prosecuting attorneys were able to piece together more details about what happened that night through the suspect's testimonies, witness statements, and various pieces of evidence. Let's get into it. Remember the stolen car that had Michael's things in it? May Shane was the one driving that car. He didn't technically steal it per se, he borrowed it from a friend, but May Shane returned the car with a bullet hole in the trunk and some random dude's stuff in the cab. That's when the owner of the car called the police, which is probably why it was dubbed a stolen car. Maybe the cops thought Michael had stolen it at the time. The car and the items inside are also the incriminating evidence the Solicitor General said they had against May Shane. Starting to make sense now? So on the night of the 19th, May Shane drove the borrowed car to pick up his cousin Jeremiah, as well as Jeremiah's friend Jamal. As they drove around drinking alcohol, Jeremiah was all like, guys, I have a great idea. Let's come into robbery and get some money. May Shane and Jamal were all like, for sure, bro, let's do it. Before going to Michael and Thelma's home, they actually went to a Chinese restaurant named Happy Star Restaurant. May Shane stayed in the car as the getaway driver while Jeremiah and Jamal burst into the restaurant with BB guns. People inside freaked out not knowing the firearms weren't real and handed over some cash. Jeremiah and Jamal grabbed the dough, ran out, jumped in the car, and May Shane hit the pedal to the metal. Some police officers in the area saw them in flee, so they turned on their lights and sped after them. Officers fired a few bullets at the car, one of which hit the trunk, but they ended up losing the three men during their pursuit. Turns out, Jeremiah and Jamal only got out of the restaurant with $60. May Shane, Jeremiah, and Jamal weren't phased by the police chase though. They switched out license plates and drove around the island for a bit before parking in the Cupacoy Bay area. They got out and started walking along the beach, which is when they then decided to break into Michael and Thelma's condo. Once they snuck inside and threatened Michael, he told them he kept some of his money in a safe in the upstairs bedroom, which was where Thelma was sleeping. So May Shane wrapped his arms around Michael's neck and held a blade up to it while the other two men went upstairs for the money. They got Thelma's attention and demanded her to open the safe. Jeremiah assured her that if she complied, they wouldn't harm her. 
Thelma got up and went to the safe, but she was so terrified that she actually entered the code wrong a few times, but eventually got it open. After Jeremiah and Jamal got the money, they grabbed Thelma and took her downstairs. They forced her on a chair and tore up a towel into strips that they used to tie her to the chair. I guess Jeremiah went back on his I won't hurt you claim. At this point in the story, things get a little blurry. According to May Shane, Michael suddenly moved and tried to help Thelma, so the blade May Shane was holding to Michael's throat accidentally slashed him. After that, May Shane said Michael was suffering in pain, so he decided to jab him a few times with the blade to put him out of his misery. And then he didn't want Thelma to have to live the rest of her life without her husband, so he decided to slay her too. During the autopsy, the examiner noted Michael's initial neck slash was way too deep for it to be an accident, so labeling this an accident was a bit of a stretch. Jeremiah and Jamal both claimed they stood outside the whole time and weren't involved in the execution process of Michael and Thelma. Officials concluded that Jeremiah and Jamal really weren't responsible for taking the king's lives, but they also didn't step in to stop May Shane. After the deed was done, May Shane said he threw the weapon in the ocean, washed his hands, cleaned up the scene with whiskey, and left the condo to buy some booze and look for some female the men ended up walking away with around $80,000 in cash and jewelry. During the trial, May Shane acted like he suffered memory loss and didn't know what happened, even though he already confessed in police interviews. Jeremiah tried to say he wasn't involved in the executions and was all like, all we did was steal a brick of f a few stacks of $100 bills from the safe. But no traces of substances were ever found in the safe when tested, and all the people who knew the king said they weren't involved with substances. So it seemed like Jeremiah was lying, which doesn't really surprise me at all. At the end of the trial, May Shane was found guilty of slaying Michael and Thelma. He received a life sentence, which is the harshest punishment a criminal can get in St. Martin since they don't have lethal sentences there. Jeremiah and Jamal were found guilty for their part in the crimes. Jeremiah got a 28-year sentence, and Jamal got a 22-year sentence. Even though it was clear the men were all guilty and we know their motive of breaking in was money, we still don't really know why they decided to execute Michael and Thelma if they were both compliant. Jeremiah said there was no plan. There was never a plan. It just happened. It just happened? Why is he talking about it like it's so casual? Michael and Thelma's family expressed relief in the court decision and expressed gratitude for all the officers, lawyers, and court officials involved in serving justice to the men who robbed them of their loved ones. Later though, all three criminal sentences would be reduced. Most notably, May Shane's was knocked down to just 30 years. Todd and a few of the other King relatives decided to pick back up on the rum business with Topper and Melanie because they knew that's what they would have wanted. The company, Topper's Rum, became a reality and soon enough bottles were being distributed in liquor stores and markets in St. Martin, Canada, and the United States. But wait until you hear this. Jamal actually worked at Topper's restaurant and bar for a brief period in 2012. So maybe he knew exactly who Michael was and that he would be a good target. Or maybe Topper and Melanie were the masterminds behind the crimes. Honestly though, they seemed super sweet and they were very shaken up about the incident, so I highly doubt that. Well, I think it's just about time to call it a day. Let me know what you think about this case in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. The suspect of a senseless slang would reveal a wild conspiracy involving a graduation dinner, coercion, a hitman, and a victim who was willing to forgive and even beg the state to have mercy on his own attacker. The night of December 10th, 2003 was supposed to be one filled with celebration and joy for the Whitaker family. Hailing from Sugarland, Texas, the family consisted of 54-year-old Kent, his 51-year-old wife Patricia, their son Bart, who was 23, and youngest son, 19-year-old Kevin. Older brother Bart was a student-to-be graduate of Sam Houston State University City, which was the cause for the celebration that fateful night in December. When the family got home that night, Bart went to his car to grab his phone before following the rest of his family through the front door. Ah, uh, 2003. Bart's brother Kevin was the first to enter the home as the family returned. As they filed into the dining room, an ear-splitting bang was heard throughout the home and Kevin immediately fell to the floor. Before they could comprehend what was happening, another loud bang and Patricia too was hit in the chest and went down. Kent was on the porch and angled away from the unknown sniper who fired a third time, knocking him to the ground as well. Bart was the last to enter and heroically threw himself on the hitman. The two struggled for a bit until the trigger was pulled again, hitting Bart in the left shoulder and stunning him. This gave the intruder his chance to run off and Bart gave chase, finally attracting some of their neighbors' attention. One of the neighbors rushed over to help and called 911 while using his shirt as a makeshift tourniquet over Ken's wounds. At the same time, Bart was also calling 911 to report that someone had pumped his family full of bullets. He told him that he'd been hit in the arm and that he'd chased the attacker out the back door and up the street but lost him. 
And the 911 operator was like, Bart, that's awesome, honey, but please stop running if you have a literal hole in your arm and wait for the paramedics to get there. They asked Bart what the guy looked like, and he said he couldn't get a good look at him, so he wasn't sure, but he thought the attacker was potentially black. By the good grace of Cheddar Bay Biscuits, Kent somehow survived the attack, but he said he remembered seeing white skin through the eye holes of the mask. Fortunately, Patricia and the younger son, Kevin, both didn't survive. Up until that point, Sugarland, Texas was known for having a low crime rate, even almost non-existent. So an attack like this was completely out of the ordinary. The first detective on the scene literally thought the operator was joking when she told him that four people had been shot in the gated community. Ken even said that when he first saw the masked marksman, he thought it was a prank being pulled by one of his son's friends. At the scene, the detectives found the weapon that had been used in the attack, a 9mm Glock registered to Kevin Whitaker. They also found a men's black leather glove lying on the curb next to Bart's car. Their first assumption was that this had been a robbery gone wrong. Intruder breaks into home, plans to steal things, family comes home early, surprises him, he can't leave any witnesses, and realizes his only option is to take them all out, bada bing bada boom. It seemed plausible, until they started poking around some more. That's when they noticed the dresser drawers of the master bedroom had all been open a few inches, but unlike their theory, none of the contents seemed to have been rifled through. Even expensive equipment and jewelry that had been left out in plain sight seemed to have gone untouched. In fact, everything seemed to have gone untouched because there were no foreign fingerprints found in the house. The only fingerprints found around the home were from the Whitakers, and investigators theorized that the intruder must have worn gloves and entered the home through a crawl space in Kevin's bedroom, which is, you know, terrifying. There was one thing that the intruder did mess with though, and that was a safe in Kevin's room that had been pried open. Kevin's safe contained a Glock that had been gifted to him by his brother, the same one that had been used in the attack that was later found downstairs. Sheriffs arrived at the scene with three hounds to see if they could try to pick up a scent. The hounds picked up smells of the attacker from the glove, the dresser drawers, Kevin's safe, and the Glock itself. Aw, good boys, who's a good detective doggy? Investigators also wanted to look into the backgrounds of each family member to find out why they'd been the targets of this seemingly random crime in the first place. When another armed robbery occurred near the Whitaker's gated community, law enforcement thought their potential suspect had struck again. However, when they got there, the hounds didn't seem to pick up the same scent they'd gotten from the Whitaker house, and it was back to the cutting board. But as the detectives continued their investigation on the Whitakers, they discovered that one of the members of the family didn't have as squeaky clean of a record as they'd made it out to be. Bart apparently had to leave high school after he was caught committing multiple robberies with other students, so they sent him to a Christian academy Academy in the hopes that the Lord could reform him. Around that time, a psychologist evaluated Bart and actually diagnosed him with delusional paranoid disorder, which is not a diagnosis to be taken lightly. People with this disorder have trouble distinguishing between what is real and imagined, and can deal with severe and dangerous bouts of psychosis if left untreated. He needed medication and therapy, not a religious school. But despite the red flags growing up and even an official diagnosis, Bart's parents never punished him for his wrongdoings. In fact, they kind of did the opposite and showered him with love, luxury vehicles, his own townhouse, and they even paid his tuition in full at both Baylor University and Sam Houston State. Whether it was denial or they just couldn't see it, Bart seemed to be dealing with some worsening mental issues that his parents weren't acknowledging. Two days later, the police department received a tip that Bart actually hadn't been enrolled at Sam Houston University for quite a while now, and they decided to confront him on it. Bart said that was correct, but that he told his mom that he wasn't graduating, and she knew it and was cool with it. So the graduation dinner was just for show? And the the watch? And the biscuits? Bart's parents still sent him tuition money, however, but no one knows what Bart ended up actually spending the money on. Three days later, on December 15th, this guy named Adam Hip went to the Sugarland PD and asked to speak to the lead detective. Ooh, come on, Adam with the T. Adam was a friend of Bart's back in high school, and he had a specific memory of him that would make Bart go from victim numero four to suspect numero uno. He told the investigators that two years ago, Bart had shocked him with a request. The two had been hanging out when Bart mentioned that he would inherit his parents' share of the family business when they were gone. Adam was like, that's a good for you, bro. And Bart was like, yeah, totally. Um, so like, say I were to hire you to do something for me. Adam even handed over to the detectives a diagram of the house that Bart had made for him, which indicated where he was supposed to wait until the family got back from dinner. Bart's roommate from Baylor was supposed to provide the weapon and drive it down from Waco to him. Adam was told to assassinate the whole family, but only to hit Bart in the arm so that he would look like a victim too. And get this, Kent and Patricia found out about it. That's right, Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker actually got wind of Bart's plot after the police received a call warning them about it. But when the police heard about the plot, they thought it was all 
all talk and didn't take it seriously, saying the plan sounded too far out. Well, they told Bart's parents about it, but Bart said it was all a misunderstanding and his parents believed him and it was water under the old bridge, you know? Investigators then tracked down Bart's previous roommate at Baylor, Justin Peters. Justin confessed that he had been involved with multiple different plans to help take out Bart's parents, discussing some plots that had fallen through in December of 2000 and April of the following year. He verified for them that Bart's motive was completely financial. After learning that Bart was keen on hiring his friends, the two investigators decided to look into two of Bart's buddies named Chris and Steven. 21-year-old Chris Brashear was Bart's roommate, and the two of them worked together at this country club with their other friend with a spectacular name, Steven Champagne. Both Chris and Steven Champagne denied involvement with the attack, but agreed to give an interview and provide DNA samples. The hounds immediately indicated that it was Chris's scent that they'd picked up on the glove, the dresser drawers, Kevin's safe, and the weapon. Oh, who's a good boy? Bart's friend from high school, Adam, agreed to help take down Bart in exchange for immunity for his original involvement with the plot. So Adam got in contact with Bart and started to record all of their conversations. In one conversation, Bart even agreed to pay Adam $20,000 if he lied to the police about him having the idea back in 2001 and set up a post office box in Dallas to deliver the money to him. But just when they thought that Bart's biscuit was baked, in June of 2004, his Chevy Yukon was discovered abandoned on the side of the road with the engine still running. And Bart was nowhere to be found. With Bart gone, the case stood at a standstill for about a year. Detectives wiretapped both Chris and Steven, hoping to hear if they knew anything about Bart's whereabouts, but the two never spoke about Bart or really to each other at all for that matter. But finally, in August of 2005, Steven Champagne had a change of heart and decided it was finally time to pop the cork. Champagne met with the detectives and confessed his involvement in the assassination of the Whitaker family. He claimed that he didn't know what the actual plan was in advance, but had agreed to drive Chris Brashear away from the Whitaker house after the attack. He also helped dispose of the evidence in a nearby lake. Stephen took a polygraph test and failed, which ultimately took his immunity off the table. The next day, Stephen gave a recorded video confession implicating himself, Chris, and Bart as the perpetrators in the Whitaker family slangs. He showed the detectives where they discarded the evidence and was immediately arrested. Divers eventually found the bag of evidence containing a water bottle that had Chris's DNA on it, a chisel with traces of paint on it from Kevin's safe, two license plates, and a glove that matched the one from the scene. On September 14, 2005, detectives got word that Bart was hiding in Mexico. A tip came in from a former co-worker of Bart's who'd found out that Bart had been using his own name as his new identity, Rudy Rios. Apparently, Bart paid Rudy $3,000 for his ID and to drive him down to Mexico. Wait, so the guy sold him his ID but then went to the cops to complain about Bart using his ID? Bart, under the new name Rudy Rios, settled down in a local town where he had gotten a job at a furniture store and even started dating the daughter from the family who owned it. And that gnarly scar he had on his arm? He told his new friends that he got it while serving in Afghanistan. He also claimed that he was an orphan and that his mother had been a lady of the night, which was why he had no family. Ugh, the audacity. On September 22nd, Bart showed up to what he thought was a regular job interview in Monterey, Mexico. There he was met by the authorities who took him into custody and yeeted him across the border back to Texas. Bart was offered a plea bargain in exchange for an admission of guilt, but for some reason he rejected it so the trial was set for March of 2007. While awaiting trial that year, the assistant DA received a Christmas card from Bart in the mail. In the card, he wrote that they should keep his family in mind during the holidays, causing the DA to worry that Bart was threatening his family. Nothing ever came from it, so I don't think that was his intent, but then again, who's to say? I have no idea what sort of reaction he was hoping the card would receive. Bart refused to enter a plea, which forced the judge to enter a plea of not guilty on Bart's behalf. The first witness to get up and speak was Kent Whitaker himself, who recounted the night that his wife and son were lost in excruciating detail. To really show the courtroom what Bart was all about, the prosecutors played a recording of a phone call between him and his dad from his cell phone where he complained about his attorney. Allegedly, Bart was furious over the fact that his attorney had the nerve to send an associate to go speak with him. The courtroom heard Bart in his own words tell his father that he wanted the best attorney that money could buy. Daddy, I want the best attorney that money can buy and I want the golden ticket to the Wonka factory. On the third day of the trial, Stephen took the stand. His job was to tell the courtroom that he had first gotten to know Bart and essentially assassinate his entire character to prove that he was the only person that could have done this. And oh, did the champagne pour. He talked about first meeting Bart in 2003 and how Bart frequently told him that he was an orphan. He also told Stephen that he was like the brother he never had. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Remember Kevin? Your actual real life biological brother, Kevin, ring a bell? Had a whole life ahead of him that you decided to end for your own selfish reasons? Nothing? Cool. 
He said that by summer of 2003, Bart was joking to him and Chris about opening fire on his family just to see their reactions. In September of 2003, Bart asked Stephen if he would be willing to do the deed for him if Bart got the family out of the house beforehand. Stephen had originally tried to back out, but Bart was all, well, technically you already know about the plan, so if you don't go through with it, you'd be guilty of conspiracy to commit fam slaughter and still be charged. So, so Stephen agreed to be the getaway driver. Bart then lied to his family, telling them that he would be graduating from Sam Houston State that December, and that he wanted a celebratory dinner. On the day of the crime, Bart and Chris drove to Sugarland in Bart's car with Stephen following. Stephen parked around the back of the restaurant so he could see the family when they arrived and left. The family unknowingly ate their last meal together while Bart enjoyed a bread pudding with congratulations spelled out in chocolate sauce on the plate. After that, he called Chris to let him know they'd be leaving shortly. Stephen followed the family back home and parked in front of the house and waited. Sure enough, a few minutes later, Chris would come sprinting out of the house and jumped in the backseat as the two drove off. Chris stole some cash from Ken's closet, and the two used it to pay for their brewskis at the bar they'd stopped in on the way home. You know, as a job well done. After only an hour and a half of deliberation, the jury found Bart guilty and sentenced him to lethal injection. Both Kent Whitaker and Bo Bartlett, Patricia's brother, pleaded for Bart's life to be spared and that he instead get life in prison. I know. Despite the fact that Bart took half of Kent's own family away from him, Bart was still his son and he couldn't bear to lose another member of his family. It's truly one of those situations where you'll never understand how you'd respond unless you're actually in it. How would any of us respond to a tragedy like this? Both men said they believed that the family had put too much pressure on Bart and he finally buckled under it. They also said he was given too much in life before he was prepared to handle it. Okay, I'll agree with that statement. However, none of their pleads seemed to land on the jury and Bart was completely emotionless during his sentencing. Chris took a plea bargain and received life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years when he'll be 53. Steven received 15 years in exchange for testifying against Bart and Chris and is actually currently out of prison. In 2008, Kent published a book he titled Murder by Family, where he detailed the events of December 10th and his decision to forgive his son and Chris. Kent has since remarried and travels the country with his wife, speaking on the power of forgiveness. A warrant for Bart's execution was set for February 22nd, 2008. 2018 at 6 p.m. The day came and Bart Whitaker ate his final meal at 5.15 p.m. But just 45 minutes before he was to be executed, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment by the governor of the state, which was also the first time the governor had ever done this. In exchange for avoiding lethal injection, Bart forfeited his right to parole. He later released a statement saying he was not only grateful for himself, but also for the sake of his father. Talk about a dry biscuit to swallow. So what are your thoughts on this one? If you had to put yourself in Kent Whitaker's shoes, what would you do? Could you forgive your son, and not only that, but ask for his life to be spared? Talk about an ethical dilemma you hope to never find yourself in. Thanks so much again for watching, you guys. This was Killer Bites, and these are my Cheddar Bay Cheesy Biscuits. We'll see you next time. Picture this, you're traveling cross country by bus. You're sharing the space with a bunch of people you don't know, reading their books, listening to music, sleeping, etc. And in the middle of the night, you hear a blood curdling scream. You look up and one of the passengers is being attacked with a huge blade. What do you do? Our case takes place in Canada where Tim McLean boarded a Greyhound bus to return home from work. He was employed in Edmonton where he worked as a carnival barker, which so cool, and was returning to Winnipeg where he lived throughout the year. Tim was born on October 3rd, 1985. People would describe Tim as a super adventurous, fun-loving guy who liked to make friends with all kinds of people. He wasn't shy and didn't have a hard time getting along with anybody. So one summer, a friend of Tim's asked him about his summer plans and if he would be interested in a possible job opportunity. And Tim was like, I'm not doing anything. What's up? And his friend was like, dude, let's travel with the carnival. And this seemed right up Tim's alley. Being a carny, that's such a fun job, especially for someone like him who loves to travel and meet new people. This totally fit his vibe. He was only 22 at the time, so why not take the gig? It's some quick cash and you're young. Live a little. While all of this was starting up for Tim, he was also in a relationship and about to become a dad. His girlfriend got pregnant and he had to make the decision to leave his summer job and head home to make living arrangements. Some of Tim's friends offered to cover his plane ticket because Tim planned on taking a Greyhound bus the whole way, which was around a 24 hour drive and that just sounds not fun. But Tim declined. I guess taking the Greyhound wasn't that big of an inconvenience. So Tim boarded Greyhound bus 1170 and picked a seat almost towards the very back of the bus, located pretty much right next to the restroom. This was a long ass trip, okay? Every so often the bus would pull over to stop and everybody would pile out of there. People gotta pee, people gotta eat, and people need to stretch their legs. Otherwise, everybody's just miserable and irritated. The bus would stop to drop off passengers as well as take more on, and at 7 p.m. during one of these stops, a man named Vince Lee boarded bus 1170. But a little 
little backstory because it makes everything juicier. Vince Lee was born in China on April 30th, 1968. He had immigrated to Canada around 2001 and officially became a citizen in the year 2006. Vince worked at Grand Memorial Church in Winnipeg doing small jobs here and there. There was a pretty large language barrier between him and his coworkers, but despite this, everyone said Vince was a friendly guy and was grateful to have a job. When Vince came to Canada, he went to college and graduated with a degree in computer programming, but he just couldn't seem to land a job in that field. But ultimately, it's frustrating not being able to communicate with people. Constantly having to go the extra mile just to express the smallest thing, I can't imagine it was easy for him at all. He was also married. His wife Anna worked as a waitress and he needed to provide for his family. They weren't in the position to pass up money-making opportunities, you dig? In 2005, Vince was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but it would go untreated, which is not a good thing. Eventually, he and his wife divorced and it was out of the blue for Anna. He left her a note saying that he was leaving and straight up dipped after that. Like, what a wild way to leave someone. It wasn't totally clear what Vince's plans were. I don't think he had one, to be honest. Sometimes you're in the heat of the moment and once you're out of it, you're left with figuring out the puzzle. Vince ended up working a series of different jobs. He took jobs at fast food restaurants, Walmart, and even worked as a paper delivery man. He was doing whatever he could. Vince's boss would say that he was a hardworking employee and took pride in what he did. No one had noted any anger issues from Vince before. You know, he wasn't someone you took major notice of because he was pretty normal, whatever that means. Despite this pretty chill, shy guy behavior, Vince got fired from his job at Walmart over a heated disagreement with a few of his coworkers and it was so bad they ended up letting him go. So around noon on July 29th, Vince Lee boarded a bus from Edmonton to Winnipeg. He was carrying a few pieces of luggage with him as well. At around 6 p.m., Vince got off of the bus, which had stopped in Manitoba. And since Vince hadn't planned anything further than leaving his wife, he didn't know where he was gonna stay. That night, he ended up sleeping on a bench close to the bus station, just in case he had the inkling to jump on another one and leave. According to a witness account, Vince was sitting up on the bench at 3 a.m., eyes bulging open. He was also seen selling his belongings off to random people, I guess to make some extra cash. One was a teenage boy who bought Vince's laptop off of him for 60 bucks. The station Vince was sleeping at only had one bus that stopped there. And at 6.55 p.m. July 30th, Vince Lee would board Greyhound Bus 1170, the same bus where Tim McLean was sitting in the very back. When Vince first got on the bus, he picked a seat towards the very front, on the complete opposite end from Tim. The bus pulled over to a rest stop after a couple hours and people got off to use the restroom, get snacks, whatever, and this is when Vince switched up his seat. He marched to the back of the bus and sat in the seat directly next to Tim. People noticed Vince immediately because he was a tall dude with a buzzed head. Tall people just get more attention. It's the facts of life. This doesn't seem to bother Tim at all. He was a people person and didn't mind having them around. He greeted Vince when he sat down, but kind of did his own thing. He listened to music and laid his head on the window. The bus left its rest stop and everyone was cozying in for the night. They were playing The Legend of Zorro on the bus, the lights had been dimmed, and everybody was ready for quiet time. Then, at around 8.30 p.m., passengers were woken up to the sound of a spine-chilling scream. Out of nowhere, totally unprovoked, Vince had taken a massive blade out of his backpack and started repeatedly thrusting it into Tim's neck and chest. Tim was doing everything in his power to fight Vince off, but the guy was on a rampage, and stopping someone in that state is close to impossible. Plus, it's super dangerous for other people to get involved. You're not exactly trained for these kinds of situations. The bus driver looked up, heard what was going on, and pulled over to the side of the highway. He shouted back at Vince to stop and put down the blade. The second the bus pulled over, everybody started running for their lives off to the side of the road, and of course, everyone was calling 911, trying to get in contact with the police as quickly as they could. Everyone was off the bus at this point, but the bus driver, Bruce, stayed on board. I guess he was trying to reason with Vince and calm the situation down. It's such a chaotic situation, he's just trying his best. That's when Vince took his attention from jabbing Tim and turned to Bruce. Vince started walking towards him, holding the knife covered in fluid. At that point, Bruce had to make a decision. Either stay on the bus with the possibility of saving Tim and potentially losing his life, or get the hell off the dang bus and lock his ass in there. And it's looking like a no from me, dog. In the middle of all of this, a truck driver passing by sees people standing outside the bus crying, screaming, and panicking. He pulled over to see what the problem was. And like that, he helped Bruce and some of the passengers barricade the doors so Vince couldn't escape. So now it's just Vince and Tim left aboard. All of the passengers who had exited the bus could see everything that was going on because of all the windows. But Vince was in there mutilating this man. Another bus that was following close behind with the overfill passengers pulled over to see what all the commotion was about. I imagine they thought the bus had broken down or something, but what an awful situation to walk into. That's when the bus driver from the second group, Bernie, had the same idea as Bruce. He decided to go on the bus and see if there was anything he could do to get Tim out of there. 
Unfortunately, the scene was too horrific for Bernie to take and how could you blame him? He couldn't make out everything that was happening because it was incredibly gruesome. But what he could make out was that Vince had dug his blade so far into Tim's neck that his head was coming off. He was trying to take off his head. Bernie wasn't going to stick around and on top of that, there wasn't anything he could do to save Tim. Vince had already taken his life from him in the most gruesome way imaginable. Bernie didn't want to be the next target. Fair enough. The only thing they could do was sit and wait for the authorities to get there. Bruce knew that Vince had to stay inside the bus. They couldn't risk him hopping in the driver's seat and fleeing the scene. Apparently, there's a switch that cuts off all the power to the bus, which genuinely could not be more convenient at this moment. So Bruce went and flipped the switch and this cut all the power off to the engine. The bus was stuck. Vince decided to take a break from brutalizing Tim's body and went to start up the bus. He was trying to get out of there ASAP, but at that moment he realized what Bruce had done and he was stuck there. This really pissed him off. He got up from the driver's seat and started repeatedly stabbing and cutting into the door through the little windows, trying to tear his way through. At this point, you have both bus drivers, the truck driver, and multiple passengers barricading the door to make sure Vince had no chance of escaping. The police finally showed up with heavily armed negotiators. They start pleading with Vince to drop the weapon or throw it out the window. They wanted him to stop cutting into the poor man. It's disgusting. But they were not getting through to him. He even yelled that he was going to stay on the bus forever. I apologize in advance for what I'm about to say. Vince had taken off Tim's head and was holding it up, showing it to everyone standing outside. He was walking up and down the aisle, licking fluid off of his hand, cutting various parts from Tim's body. Around 10 p.m., the passengers on the side of the road were transported from the crime scene into town to be questioned. And super early in the morning, a Greyhound bus would take a group of these people to the nearest store so they could get out of the clothes they were sitting in. Some of the people sitting close to Tim and Vince had DNA on their clothing and they needed to change out of them. After this, officials put them on a different bus and they were sent home. During this time, Tim had broken a window in the back of the bus and jumped out. Police brought out the taser to calm him down. I don't know if that makes sense, but regardless, they get the guy in handcuffs. But the rest of the team has to go on the bus and scope out the scene. They would find nothing but horror. Various pieces of Tim's body had been shoved into small bags and thrown around the bus, and there were very obvious parts, such as his nose, that were missing. But once Vince's pockets were searched, it was found. Tim's eyes were also missing, but they were never located. It was assumed that Vince had eaten them along with other parts of his organs. Cool. On March 3rd, 2009, the trial for Vince Lee began. He came in with the plea that he wasn't criminally responsible, meaning he acknowledged what he did, but that he wasn't in the right frame of mind to know what he was doing. He said that when he first got on the bus, he started to hear these voices and they were saying he was in danger. Then when he switched seats, he said he heard the voice of God telling him to kill Tim or else he would lose his life. At the end of the day, Vince would not be found criminally responsible for any of this. Vince was required to seek mental help per court order because he was dealing with schizophrenia and it was just totally untreated. People should get the help they need, absolutely. But Vince Lee was never criminally charged with slaughtering Tim McLean, which made lots of people very upset, as I'm sure you can imagine. But the judge agreed. Vince could not be held responsible for this because of his mental state. Vince changed his name legally to Will Baker, and as of 2017, he was completely discharged and allowed to walk free. He no longer lives in a group home and is completely independent. Now what do you all think about this? Because to me, it leaves Tim's family totally abandoned. They didn't get any justice for this terrible crime and Tim's baby grew up without a father. There are so many people that are affected by this, more than just Vince and Tim. Passengers, the investigators, the legal teams, the family and friends, all of these people are left without a sense of closure. But I do agree with what Canada's got going on. They want to help people. They want to provide services so that they can be rehabilitated and join society again in a productive, positive way. In the United States, however, Seems like we can't really get that through our heads, huh? Number one in the world for the highest number of people incarcerated? USA! USA! I say this ironically. Well, that was the tragic story of Tim McLean. I'm super interested in your thoughts about this one. You want to help these people, but you also need to provide justice. So many people were affected by this and it's kind of bumming me out that a murderer is just walking free. You know what I mean? That's a wrap on that. See you all next time. On the afternoon of December 2nd, 2020, a deer hunter was making his way through the woods of North Carolina when he saw an abandoned car stuck in a rut. It was a gray Chevy Colorado pickup truck, all decked out with matte black wheels. As the hunter got closer, he saw the bodies of two men, one in the bed of the truck, the other on the ground. 
Both men had bullet wounds and casings were all over the ground. After the hunter reported his findings, the police arrived at the scene to investigate. The victims were both declared lifeless and identified as army soldiers. The man in the bed of the truck was 37-year-old William, or Billy Levine II. The man on the ground was 44-year-old Timothy Dumas. Billy took multiple bullets to the chest before being wrapped in a nylon army blanket and placed in the bed of his truck. Under the blanket, Billy was only wearing a pair of short shorts, more commonly referred to as army undies, so it almost seemed like he was sleeping when he was first attacked. Timothy took a bullet to the head, and there didn't seem to be anything notable about his placement or clothing. The weapon wasn't at the scene, and not much evidence was found that suggested who was responsible. So Billy and Timothy were found in the woods near a Fort Bragg training area in North Carolina. In recent years, Fort Bragg was home to many substance-related scandals. No narcotics were recovered from the scene, but detectives theorized that it had something to do with the crime. His best friend's wife said it was out of control. Almost every time I saw Billy, he was strung out on something. Once the police found out about that, they jumped to the conclusion that the crime was a deal gone wrong. Both Billy and Timothy were actually under investigation for smuggling narcotics on Fort Bragg, so the theory checked out. And get this. Billy was an executioner himself, so he had a target on his back for sure. Back in 2018, Billy snuffed his fellow soldier, Mark, and he was never charged for the crime. He wasn't even kicked out of the military. Uh... So, Billy and Mark were absolute besties. Mark suffered a traumatic brain injury from a detonator accidentally going off, so he had to work a desk job at Fort Bragg. In mid-March, Mark went to Disney World in Florida with his wife and daughter. Billy tagged along. On the car ride home to North Carolina, Mark apparently started acting a little crazy. Billy said his bestie thought they were being followed and listened to, but Mark's wife said he seemed fine when she talked to him that day. I'm not sure who to believe, the bestie or the wifey. Well, the men pulled up to Billy's house on the afternoon of March 21st. Mark started working on his car in the driveway, taking out his battery or something. One thing led to another, and all of a sudden, Mark and Billy were shouting at each other. About what, we don't know. When their words weren't enough, the fight got physical. Sometime during the wrestling match, Billy went inside and locked the door. In the home was Mark's daughter. She said that she was scared by her uncle Billy, so she unlocked the door for her dad Mark to come inside. When she opened the door, she saw her daddy was mad and walking towards uncle Billy. Uncle Billy came around and fired a bullet at her dad. She acted out her dad falling to the ground. I looked at my daddy's face and I knew he was gone. Wow. It's already tragic for your dad to be viciously slain, but I can't imagine how awful that has to be for that to happen when you're a kid and to witness the whole thing. It's not clear who called 911, but the police were notified of the incident and immediately rushed to the home where they found Mark lying face down with three bullet wounds from a 45 caliber firearm. When Billy was questioned about the incident, he said Mark went after him with a screwdriver. But a screwdriver wasn't recovered from the scene, and Billy never said anything about moving it. The president of the International Association of Forensic Criminologists reviewed the case details and said, the shooter's own words bury his ass because there is no screwdriver. Did it disappear or melt? Someone's tampered with the crime scene or he's lying. He said it, not me. Later on in his interview, Billy reported Mark was acting crazy and he was nervous because he couldn't see his hands. But wait, didn't Billy just say Mark attacked him with a screwdriver? Something isn't adding up here. So here's where things get super suspicious for the army. In the memorandum about Mark's demise, the Special Forces Command first claimed Mark took his own life. They later changed the report to say he passed away in the line of duty. In the line of duty? More like in his own home off duty. The Sheriff's Office ruled the incident a justifiable homicide, which means they believed Billy acted out of self-defense. And just like that, Billy was picked up from the station and sent right back to work. He was never charged for the crime and wasn't subjected to a toxicology report either. A police detective in the area said the Delta Force is a very hush-hush community. They do what they want. Yeah, it seems like it. But that wasn't the last time Billy found himself in a run-in with the law. In February of 2019, he was charged with a felony for harboring an escapee. His court date was set for March of that year, but sometime before then, Billy's charges and court dates literally vanished from the records. Other than the screenshots some people took of the case details before they were deleted, there is no trace of this ever happening. Okay, this is just weird. I don't know what is going on, but I do not like it. So now back to Billy and Timothy's case. If Billy has that shady of a history, I'm sure a handful of people had reason to want him gone. Timothy's history is more secretive, but it's possible he was into some sketchy business too. 
Even still, I don't think any issue is worth the men losing their lives. As of now, no public statements have been made about the suspect, if the authorities even have one right now. But sadly, this is just one of many homicides that have taken place at Fort Bragg. Holly and John Wimmuck were both in the military when they fell in love and got married. Holly was an army nurse stationed at Fort Bragg, John was a marine stationed two and a half hours away in Camp Lejeune. After John came back from seven months on a ship in the Persian Gulf, he started to physically abuse his wife. One July day in 2008, Holly didn't show up for a shift at the Womack Army Medical Center, which worried her coworkers. The previous night, Holly called one of her friends, April, and left a voicemail. April had just gotten off from a 12-hour shift, so she went straight to sleep without calling Holly back. The next morning, April woke up to a bunch of missed phone calls. She called the number back, and the person on the other end of the line said, Is Holly with you at your apartment? April got a sinking feeling and decided to stop by Holly's apartment with some of Holly's other friends and coworkers. There, the group noticed the smell of gasoline and smoke. They peered into the windows and found remnants of a fire, but no Holly. When police officers were called out to investigate, they noticed Blaze were missing from the kitchen and a chunk of carpet had been cut out. Oh no, missing carpet is never a good sign. They determined the fire was set intentionally. And with Holly still nowhere to be found, a missing persons report was filed and a search began. That summer, there had been two other missing female soldiers at Fort Bragg, so it was theorized that they were all connected. On June 21st, guests at a nearby motel filed several complaints about a rank smell coming from one of the rooms. In that room, one of the missing women, Megan Tuma, was found lifeless in the bathtub. Officials said she had been there for days and no one suspected anything because a do not disturb sign was on her door. Megan had also just arrived at Fort Bragg two weeks earlier, so no one really knew her to notice she was missing. To make matters worse, Megan was seven months pregnant at the time. Gosh, that really takes a sick person to do something so awful to a pregnant woman like that. An unknown person started writing letters to Fayetteville police and newspapers in the style of the Zodiac Killer. The writer admitted to slaying Megan and signed a Zodiac-like symbol at the bottom. So when Holly went missing, detectives feared there was a mass executioner on the loose targeting women at Fort Bragg. With that in mind, investigators began interviewing Holly's family and friends to see if they knew anyone that might do this to her. Following protocol, Holly's husband John was questioned first since he was Holly's next of kin. Even though John was stationed at Camp Lejeune, he spent a lot of time going back and forth between him and Holly's places, so they essentially shared the apartment. John said he knew nothing about the incident other than the fact that Holly was missing and their apartment had been set ablaze. Yeah, and the entire world knew all of that too. Come on, John, you have to know more than that. But he assured detectives that that was all he knew. He said, I don't know where she is. Haven't talked with her. Um, don't know anything. With that, John was sent home and investigators spoke with other friends and family members to get down to the bottom of Holly and John's relationship. That's when they found out things were extremely complicated between the two. John was known for being extremely rude and aggressive to Holly. Apparently, he didn't like the fact that Holly had a superior ranking. Oh my god. Heaven forbid a woman excels. In addition to the heat Holly got from John, one of John's old girlfriends resurfaced and started harassing Holly too. Things got so bad, Holly filed for a restraining order where she wrote, I have changed my phone number six times. She has had individuals contact my friends looking for me. This has been going on for eight months. Wow, that is so bad. Obviously, when detectives found all of that out, they suspected the ex-girlfriend for being involved in Holly's disappearance. The ex was questioned by the police, and she said she had nothing to do with Holly's disappearance. She was shocked to hear the news and was probably freaking out because she looked super suspicious by harassing poor Holly for several months. But despite the suspicion, the ex's alibi checked out and investigators were already looking into another hot lead. Some people from Holly's building reported seeing a male figure running with a bag, getting into a black truck, and driving off. And the more of Holly's friends detectives interviewed, the more they theorized John was responsible. One of Holly's friends recalled a time when Holly told her about a terrifying incident with John. Holly said John showed her a bullet that he carved her name into. He said, this is your bullet and this is my bullet. After that, John held up a firearm to his head like he was going to pull the trigger. He also aimed it at her like he was going to knock her out. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? Oh, that phrase I use is the military way of saying WTF. You should try it sometime. It's pretty fun to say. Anyway, after the scary incident, Holly decided enough was enough. She sent her two kids from a previous relationship to live with their biological father and looked into getting a restraining order against John and divorcing him. Run and never look back. 
Holly was granted a temporary restraining order in May. When the order was up in 10 days, she was supposed to appear in court for the official restraining order. Holly never showed up in court that day, so her case was dismissed. Throughout it all, John remained a top suspect. A few other people's names were tossed in the hat too, including John's buddy and fellow Marine, Kyle. A few Marines from the base reported hearing Kyle asking if he could borrow a truck from someone on July 9th. He said he needed it to help a friend move some things that would not fit in a car. Kyle was brought in for questioning and he said that friend was John, but alleged John called off their meeting, so Kyle hung out with his wife instead. Unknown to Kyle, investigators had already spoken with his wife and she said that story wasn't true. So Kyle changed his story and admitted helping John, but said he only moved a few things from John and Holly's apartment before he left for the night. Well, not long after that, Holly's body was discovered buried in a shallow grave of a rural area right by Camp Lejeune. Holly's body had been dismembered and burnt, and there were a few blades found nearby. Those blades were an exact match to the ones missing from Holly's set at home. Once Kyle found out about the discovery, he came to his senses and confessed. He told the cops that John called him and asked for help moving things in Fayetteville. Kyle said John was his military brother and he'd do anything for him. He had his six. That's back. But when Kyle arrived and John told him he'd snuffed Holly and needed help disposing of the body, he was all like, oh, what did I get myself into? Instead of saying no and calling the cops, Kyle helped, making him an accessory to the crime, which is exactly what he was charged for. John was charged for first degree homicide. The stories of Billy, Timothy, Mark, Holly, and Megan are just a few of the many deaths that have occurred at Fort Bragg. In 2020 alone, at least 44 soldiers have passed away at Fort Bragg, 21 of which were self-inflicted acts. Most of those were substance related too. And one of the most concerning elements of this topic is the fact that the special forces keep these cases extremely secretive and even try to cover them up. In January 2020, a 19-year-old soldier was found in his bunk and his body was already in an advanced state of decomposition. In May, a 21-year-old was decapitated on a camping trip with six of his fellow paratroopers. No arrests were made. And in December of that year, just three weeks after Billy and Timothy's case, a 31-year-old army medic fired bullets at his pregnant wife. So something bad is clearly happening at Fort Bragg and no one is trying to address the situation. While yes, a lot of these individuals were involved in illegal acts or aggressive partners, it's all extremely shady how they all happen to people at Fort Bragg. And it's even more shady that military officials are trying to cover it up. See you next time on Killer Bites. One of the most popular and terrifying urban legends to come out of the state of Virginia is the legend of the Bunny Man. I honestly wouldn't be too surprised if you've heard of him in some capacity or another. The story goes that the Bunny Man was an escaped convict from an insane asylum who lived in the woods, wielded an axe, and wore a giant dirty rabbit suit. He dismembered and feasted on wild bunnies, and he really liked his privacy. Some say the bunny man was a real person, while others say he's a spirit that haunts the Colchester Bridge. Either way, you don't want to be caught near the bridge after midnight, or you might end up like one of his rabbits. Skinned, gutted, and hanging from a rope, quietly swaying in the breeze for some poor soul to eventually find you. Like I mentioned before, our urban legend is gonna take us all the way over to Virginia, where the cities of Colton and Fairfax meet. It's the turn of the 20th century, and the city of Fairfax was just working on putting the pieces back together while also experiencing a boom in population. Cause you know, the Civil War was just a thing, so you've got a lot of young men coming home to their wives and are making up for lost time. So the men were back from the war, the women were having their babies, and the tiny town was quickly growing into a densely populated city. But an increase of residents in Fairfax meant there would also be an increase of shadier individuals inhabiting the town as well. Suddenly, the small farming community where everybody knew everybody was no longer a thing. 
residents became less trusting of each other and started locking their doors at night. Not to mention, something we know now that we didn't back then is how difficult it is for soldiers to readjust to civilian life after returning home from war. They were dealing with mental illnesses and conditions like PTSD, anxiety, psychosis, and depression, but there wasn't any sort of proper therapy or services set up for these young, war-torn guys. They didn't know much about mental illness back then, and men who came home from war were expected to be these strong, stoic heroes, when really they were just these young adults who were mentally scarred and completely broken from what they endured. In those days, when a soldier was showing signs of depression or PTSD, they used terms like soldier's heart or shell shock, but really, it was mental illness that wasn't being properly treated. This led to a rise in crime in the city, which apparently led to them building a state institution for the criminally insane just on the border of where Fairfax meets Clifton. In the deep, dark forest, of course. Because you wouldn't build an asylum on the beach. It's gotta be someplace ominous and foreboding. I mean, stick with the theme here. But once the institution was built, most of the original residents from the nearby town of Clifton protested that they didn't want to live near the asylum and no longer felt safe. The facility created this big public outrage from the town that would eventually lead to its closing in 1904. The town was happy, but the convicts sure weren't. They were now going to be transferred by bus to a new prison, and during this transfer was where the legend of the bunny man was born. So the story goes that the convicts were piled onto this old bus that was headed for the Lorton Reformatory, but on the way, the bus took a hard swerve and crashed. The hardened criminals looked at the shattered windows and dazed officers and saw their chance. A few dozen inmates charged the front, while others broke out their side windows, launching themselves out and dashing off into the darkness. Over the course of the next several months, almost all of the escaped convicts would be found and picked up. All except for two, Marcus Loster and Douglas Griffin. Months would pass while they searched for their remaining escapees, but it was as if the two men had just vanished into the night. Finally, one night when they were out searching for Marcus and Douglas, they noticed something they'd seen only a few times before. The bodies of several mutilated and half-eaten bunnies scattered on the ground. But this time, the carcasses of the rabbits had been left in a sort of trail that dotted the forest floor, and it didn't look like they'd remembered to cover their tracks. Follow the bunny and see where it goes. This is when the detectives would finally stumble upon the alleged Bunny Man's Bridge after following this awful trail of nightmares. Trail of night hairs. I'll see myself out. So this overpass was the Colchester Bridge, or as it's still lovingly referred to by residents today as Bunny Man Bridge. The story goes that under the overpass, the cops found more mutilated rabbits that had been strung up and hung from the bridge, kind of like wind chimes that swayed gently in the breeze. To their horror, the men saw that past the hanging rabbit carcasses was the body of Marcus Loster, dangling from the bridge with a handwritten note attached to his foot that read, You'll never find me, no matter how hard you try. Signed, The Bunny Man. Bum bum bunny. <laughs> According to legend, if you dare walk below the bridge after midnight, the bunny man will cut you up and hang you just like he did to Marcus. But whether or not you believe the stories to be fact, fiction, or fluff is truly for you to decide. And while most urban legends become more dramatic and embellished over the years as they're told, you might be surprised to learn that the legend of the bunny man really is rooted in a mysterious incident that happened in Fairfax in the 70s. So while that might not necessarily go along with our turn of the century, insane asylum themed legend, there really was a man who dressed in a rabbit suit, wielded an axe, and terrified the city of Fairfax for a brief moment in history. This legitimate account was reported about in the papers, and since then, dozens of different stories of Bunny Man lore have emerged over the years. And God, some of them are so melodramatic and fun. 
Let's hop to it. Other variations of the story include that Bunny Man Douglas Griffin was first committed to the asylum as a 12 year old after attacking his parents with an axe on Easter Sunday. Clearly, we're embellishing a bit, but wow. We love a good story. Other versions claim Douglas was the only inmate who was never found, and that on Halloween night, several teens were hanging out under Bunny Man Bridge when they were attacked at the stroke of midnight. It's always the stroke of midnight in these types of stories. But let me ask you this. Have you ever referred to midnight with the word stroke in your life? Like seriously, we just casually accept this phrase every time we hear it in a scary story or fairy tale. But darling, I live for the drama. So at the stroke of midnight, the teens were attacked and found hanging beneath the bridge the next morning, gutted like rabbits. And like so many of my favorite urban legends, this one has all the terrifying details, but none of the important ones, like what year it happened or the names of the people it happened to. So you know that this is probably a credible story. The officers barely had time to collect themselves when they heard a maniacal laugh coming from atop the bridge, standing there in a makeshift bunny mask made out of rabbit fur and waving an axe was the bunny man. According to this story, as he cackled and howled, he was struck by an oncoming train. There's another tale of teenagers that would share an encounter with the bunny man, and honestly, this one is a bit similar to the other, so I wouldn't be surprised if they were just different versions of the same story. The difference with this one was that a couple of teen dudes were driving with their girlfriends on Halloween night, of course, when they decided they wanted to scare them. They headed out to Old Bunny Man Bridge, where his soul allegedly haunts it since being hit by the train, and dragged their screaming, giggling girlfriends out of the car to tease them, saying that the ghost of the Bunny Man was gonna get them. Sounds like a blast, guys. It was almost midnight, and I guess the teasing became too much for one of the girls, and she broke away from the group and ran back onto the road. At the stroke of midnight, oh brother, she saw a bright flash of light under the bridge, and when the light faded, she saw all six of her friends' bodies mutilated and hanging beneath the bridge, and an axe stuck in the windshield of their car. Ooh. So yeah, obviously, if real teenagers had actually been found dangling from a bridge, you'd think there'd be some sort of report about it in the archives. But it ain't. But just because that version of the story isn't in the archives, doesn't mean the bunny man isn't. He so totally is. In 2002, a Fairfax County archivist published what is considered to be one of the only credible and foremost papers on the subject. And I think the real story is even stranger than the legends. On October 18th, 1970, Air Force Academy cadet Robert Bennett was sitting in the car with his fiance on a road in Fairfax. The road was near Robert's uncle's house, and it was nearing midnight when a man in a white suit suit with long bunny ears appeared at the front of their car. He screamed at the couple that they were trespassing on his private property and that he had their plates. He hurled a hatchet through the front car window and thank the Lord neither of them were hurt, but they were super shaken up and filed a police report. The incident was reported in the Washington Post and only two weeks later, the bunny man struck again. About a block away from the first sighting, a private security guard named Paul Phillips was doing his rounds at a new housing development in the neighborhood when he spotted somebody on the front porch of one of the new unoccupied homes. According to the Washington Post article that was legitimately published on October 31st, Phillips said he started to talk to the man, but that's when he started chopping. The dude picked up his axe, which I can only assume glints in the moonlight, and takes several swings at a post on the porch, screaming again about people trespassing and threatening to chop his head off. After the newspapers ran the story, apparently Bunny Man himself contacted the local authorities. He told them he didn't want the new houses being built in his woods and that there would be consequences if they did. What? No money eggs at Easter? He told authorities that he'd meet with them at the Colchester Bridge, but never showed up and was never heard from again. But when word spread that the bunny man had contacted the authorities himself, 
There was an all-out media frenzy. Stories and sightings of the Bunny Man were being reported from all around the country, leading to dozens of local teens trekking out to the bridge for a thrill. In 1970 alone, there were apparently over 50 Bunny Man sightings reported from all over. And nowadays, it's tradition for local kids on Halloween night to go exploring under the bridge in hopes of spotting the man in the fursuit. The archivist who looked into the legend Brian Conley was actually able to track down the now married couple who first reported the incident over 45 years earlier. Robert Bennett and his wife, whose name I can't find anywhere, which really bothers me because she has a name other than Robert's wife, confirmed for Brian what they saw that night when they met with him. They told him vivid details from the incident, as well as Robert's aunt who helped them afterwards. She even remembers combing the shattered window glass out of their hair. To this day, no one knows who the bunny man was or what he wanted. Brian the archivist believes it was possibly an elderly resident who owned the property that the couple was allegedly trespassing on. Nevertheless, the town of Clifton has full on embraced the legend of the bunny man and sells t-shirts and souvenirs with his image and put up a haunted Halloween attraction every year in his honor. And while the legend may have been embellished upon and exaggerated over the years to become this frighteningly bizarre tale, I think the truth of what actually happened that night on the road is just as terrifyingly strange. And that about does it for this episode. Remember, if you happen to find yourself wandering beneath the Colchester Bridge and see the shadow of a large man in bunny ears, you better hippity hoppity get the hell off his property. See you next time! For many of us, college is the first place to truly explore who you are. You're away from your parents, living in a new city, figuring out a work-life balance. For a lot of us, it's the first time we learn how to do laundry. It can be a lot at once, but it's such a crucial time for so many people. Now, most of us don't imagine our senior year ending by getting brutally attacked, much less by one of our own teachers. But for Yale student Suzanne Joven, this would be the end of her journey. Suzanne Joven was born in a beautiful medieval village in Germany on January 26th, 1977. That makes her an Aquarius for all my Zodiac peeps out there. She was super bright from a young age and picked up things quickly. She spoke multiple languages and played the piano and the cello. In the fifth grade, she started taking Latin. And in the seventh grade, she took French. Okay, we get it, you're brilliant. She was a star student, double majoring in chemistry and biology. She passed all of her exams with flying colors, which I can imagine made her parents happy because they were both cell and molecular biologists. Staying in the family business, I could see. Suzanne took academics seriously and cared about her future. She was super smart and got accepted into Yale, which was her mom's alma mater. College can be the star of a young adult's life. It's where you start deciding what career path you want to take. But when Suzanne got into school, she decided that the science route wasn't really for her. And honestly, props to her for realizing that out quickly. I feel like a lot of times we do certain things to appease people in our lives, like our parents, friends, significant others, yada, yada, yada. But she didn't want to do that. She didn't just want to do something for money. She wanted to love what she was doing. She wanted to help people and make a difference. Clearly money wasn't her main concern in life. And that's where she decided to double major in political science and international studies. Suzanne's friends described her as full of exciting contradictions. She was funny, friendly, active, and people really liked her. She was the one in the friend group who made all the decisions and knew how to have a good time. I'm not gonna lie, I relate a lot to her, minus the being brilliant part. Her friends said that media coverage portrayed Suzanne as this timid, shy person, but that couldn't have been further from the truth. She was opinionated, confident, and brilliant. She was physically and mentally fit, and she could handle herself. So our case began December 4th, 1998. Suzanne was working on her senior essay covering Osama bin Laden. She went to drop off her most recent draft at her senior advisor's office, James Vanderbilt. After this, she headed to an event organized through the group Best Buddies. This was an organization where college students were paired with people from halfway homes, many of them who were intellectually disabled adults. They would host events to create one-on-one -on -one friendships and help find employment opportunities for them. Usually, these people were abandoned by their families and didn't have a place where they felt belonged or where they were supported. Suzanne joined this group when she first got to Yale. By this time, 
She was the head of her local group. She hosted a pizza party at Trinity Lutheran Church for the local Best Buddies chapter, arriving early to set up and leaving late to clean and take down the space. She finished cleaning around 8.30 and offered some friends from the group a ride home. She used a borrowed university vehicle and dropped it off in the Yale parking lot around 8.45. She then began making her way back to her apartment on foot, which was about two blocks away. As she was walking, she ran into a group of friends who wanted her to go to the movies. Suzanne told them no, she wasn't feeling up for it because she was exhausted from the day and needed to get studying done. Go Suzanne! I admire her self-control. I would have probably been doing keg stands, but that's, that's, that's just me. Anyway, Suzanne arrived at her second floor apartment and sent out an email at 9.02. In the message, she told one of her friends that they could borrow some of her books, but she said she needed to pick them up for the person she lent them to before. Around 9.10, Suzanne logged off her computer and there was no way to know if she contacted anyone else while she was there because Yale phone systems didn't trace calls. She could have been calling the person who had the books, but unfortunately, nobody knows who that person was. Suzanne then realized she forgot to drop off the car keys to the borrowed university vehicle. She hadn't been home very long and was still in the same clothes, but decided it was best to walk to the office to drop off the keys. Along the way, Suzanne ran into her classmate, Peter, which is how we know about the car key situation. He said that she had no other plans for the evening besides homework and sleep. According to Peter, Suzanne seemed totally normal when they were chatting. She acted a little tired, but Nothing at all weird. She didn't have any belongings with her, like her backpack, and in her hand was a small piece of paper. Around 9.25 p.m., Suzanne was spotted walking, but she was taking a roundabout way from her usual route to the apartment. A female student leaving a Yale versus Princeton hockey game early to hit up an off-campus party said she passed Suzanne on her way. She didn't seem concerned by any of Suzanne's actions. Everything seemed totally normal. The student remembered seeing a Hispanic or black man wearing a hoodie walking the same way that Suzanne was. And behind, a few paces back, was a white dude with blonde hair wearing glasses. At some point in the next 30 minutes, Suzanne's life would be taken away from her. At 9.55, police dispatchers got a call from a couple who said there was a woman gushing fluid on the side of the road. The location was about 1.7 miles from where that girl saw Suzanne walking. Later on, a piece of the knife would be found within her skull. Her body was found face down, fully clothed, wearing a watch and earrings with a dollar bill in her pocket. Immediately, police thought there was no freaking way that this could have been a robbery gone wrong. Suzanne was pronounced deceased at New Haven Hospital at 1026, but it's believed that she was already gone about 15 minutes before the police had arrived. She'd been seen walking around 925 and 955. That's when she was found almost two miles away. There was no way she could have been walking that far that quickly. She must have been driven or in a car at some point in those 30 minutes. Suzanne's friends insisted that she would have never gotten into a vehicle with someone that she didn't know. So it makes more sense that she got into a car when she realized it was someone she knew. Neighbors said they heard a loud argument around the time of the attack and a light brown van parked right next to where the body was discovered. It was reported that a guy in his late 20s or early 30s wearing a green jacket was running away from the area. And the dude was apparently booking it. And like many cases that we've covered, the police generally had no idea how to handle the evidence. They either lose it or mishandle it and end up pushing back investigations. And this day was no exception to that trend, sadly. At the crime scene, police found a bottle of Fresca. When it was tested for DNA, Suzanne's fingerprints were discovered, along with the palm of an unidentified person. This knowledge wasn't released to the public until after three years after she was executed. This seemed like a small piece of evidence, right? Yeah, you can get some DNA. It was just a bottle of soda. Come to find out, once that info of Fresca was released three years later, there was only one store in the town that sold Fresca, one block from where Suzanne lived. New Haven police, however, didn't retrieve any security footage or interview anyone from the store, despite public outcry. Blink, blink. Side note, the police are really dumb and secretive in this case, and it is wildly frustrating to me. I understand why some info is kept out of the media. It's sensitive information, and you don't know who's listening. When it comes to things like this, why not release it to the public? Why not give someone the chance to come forward with information? We need to work smarter, not harder, people. It wasn't until 11 years after Suzanne's demise, the DNA from under the fingernails and the Fresca bottle were tested. There was a match to an unidentified person. Sadly, it was connected to one of the lab technicians. The samples had been contaminated. Oh my gosh, it's like nobody knows how to do their job. Just 
Just give me the goggles and the lab coat and some gloves and a gun and handcuffs. I'll do all the jobs. It's fine. I got it. I can only imagine how frustrating something like that would be for the family. Months went by and no progress was made in the case. Suzanne's parents wrote several letters to the governor of Connecticut and eventually they got a letter back saying that there were thousands of DNA samples backlogged into their system. A group called the Joven Task Force was assembled to give attention to this case. A witness came forward about a white dude with blonde hair running past her the evening of the attack. Police showed her a photo of current professor at Yale, James Vandeveld. She said it wasn't him. Then they brought her into James's office to meet him in person. Which, like, why would you bring somebody into a potential murderer's office? Again, she said that wasn't the guy. And after that, the New Haven police never contacted her again. She met up with a sketch artist to drop the man she saw that night, but the task force wasn't super interested in this. Instead, they were more concerned about who had the books that Suzanne lent out. So whoever it was, they never came forward. Everyone was stumped. And they wanted to put this case to rest and, you know, give the family some peace. They need to put somebody in handcuffs. In these types of situations, the people closest to the victim are immediately questioned. For example, they brought in Suzanne's boyfriend, but ruled him out quickly because he was on a train ride to New York. Also, he took her passing really, really hard, as I imagine any of us would. Then detectives zeroed in on James Vanderbilt, Suzanne's senior essay advisor. They wrote about it in the paper. Well, he never outright said his name. They did say Suzanne's senior essay advisor and professor. Not exactly the trickiest code to hack, you know? The police questioned other faculty, students, and people close to James to figure out who he was and how they could put this on him. The main theories were that he was either having an affair with Suzanne or wanted something more and she didn't. And as a result, his classes were canceled. Nobody wanted to sit and take notes from a suspected criminal. In fact, Suzanne's friends mentioned how pissed she was at James for his lack of attention for her essay. Her parents remembered hearing his name around Thanksgiving break when Suzanne was home. She was annoyed that she wasn't getting enough mentoring. And this is super weird because the sergeant of New Haven police admitted that they didn't have any evidence connecting James to the crime. They kept hammering into him. I assume the brutality of the attack led them to believe that it was done by someone she knew. She had a blade broken off four inches into her head. That sounds pretty personal. And most of the time, when something is that intense and gruesome, it's known as a crime of passion. When James was interviewed by police the first time, four days after the attack, he took it to mean that he wasn't a person of interest. Then they brought him in for questioning again and accused him of manslaughter. Big jump. He was totally down to give information and didn't even call his lawyer. Come my guy, you're a professor at Yale. Don't you know that you shouldn't talk to the cops without a lawyer? They don't want to figure out the problems. They just wanted to pin it on somebody. James offered to take a lie detector test and have his car and apartment searched. Officers did search his car, but never gave him the test or searched his home. It's so frustrating. James was asked to leave Yale because of all of this, but people still wanted answers. So Yale ended up hiring their own private investigators. If you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. And in doing this, the evidence and DNA samples were finally brought to be tested. And guess what? James' DNA didn't match the evidence that they found. Yet, they continued to focus on James and James alone as a suspect. After James was let go from Yale, he needed a new job and was recruited by the US Navy. But the investigators didn't like him and needed to ruin his life. So they called up his new supervisors and tried to get him fired. This guy cannot catch a break. He's gone through years of public scrutiny, suspected of manslaughter with no evidence linking him to the crime, and the cops are trying to take away your job too? So rude. But there's a small plus side to all of this. James wasn't gonna let these people walk all over him. So Yale and the state agreed to a monetary settlement, meaning he was gonna get his bag for all the years of BS he had to go through. He was eventually ruled out as a suspect and the New Haven Police Department had to pay him up to $200,000 in damages. Sadly, no one has been arrested for this terrible crime, and Suzanne's attacker got to walk free, which is honestly heartbreaking. That's where people start to bring up theories, because what do you do when you have no viable answers? You try and make them. One theory about who could have done this to Suzanne is a man named Billy. Now, Billy isn't his real name, but that's what he's called. Billy was known as the guy who couldn't handle rejection and would just yell at women who turned him down. You know Billy. I know Billy that all the ladies love that. And Billy's roommates said he was obsessed with the Suzanne Joven case, and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that linked the two. For example, this guy spoke German and went to Yale the same time that Suzanne did, and he was known to wear a green jacket. Which if you guys remember, 
One of the witnesses said that she saw a man in a green jacket running from the scene. Another theory points to an officer behind all of this, because on the first floor of Suzanne's apartment was the police department. And if you remember, they messed up the handling of this case so badly, it kind of makes people think that maybe they have something to do with it. Which we can't rule out people for breaking the law just because it's their job to enforce it. But here's what I think. I think it was a total random senseless killing. Suzanne was a beautiful young woman who was walking alone at night. And when Suzanne took a weird route walking back home, I feel like she noticed that she was being followed and tried to throw him off her path. On top of that, the distance from where she was last seen to where her body was found makes me think that maybe she was running or was forced into a vehicle. How else could she have gotten so far so quickly? But unfortunately, no one knows for sure who really did this. I just hate unsolved cases like this because you just want justice for Suzanne and for everyone that was close to her. But unfortunately, we may never get the closure we're looking for because of so many different factors. And that, my friends, was the case of Suzanne Joven. So what do you guys think? Was it the Professor, Billy, or someone else entirely? Tell me what you think in the comments. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this journey. And now that my plant-based lobster rolls are ready, I'm gonna go eat them. Phil Rouse was one of those old-fashioned guys whose whole life was devoted to vintage cars. The story goes that the day he found this abandoned Model A Ford in a cotton warehouse, he was totally hooked, and cars were his life. ka -chow. He'd finally gotten to a place in life where he was able to quit his job and follow his dreams of opening up an antique car restoration business. He built the garage near his home and asked his friend, Kimo Coelho, if he was interested in working with him. And the two agreed to split the profits equally and call the business K&P's Auto Restoration. Cute, right? When Steve White, Phil's neighbor of 15 years, poked his head over the fence one day and asked if they needed any help, Steve was officially in the business. The agreement the three came up with was that Phil was the head of the business who would contribute the capital, Kimo would do the actual hands-on restoring of the cars part, and Steve would be more of a silent partner who handled the business finances and all the not fun paperwork K&P didn't want to do themselves. Kimo and Steve didn't exactly get along, but Phil always provided that buffer between the men. But then Phil got sick. For a man nearing his 60s, this was cause for some concern at first, but Phil tried to push through it, thinking it was just the flu or some sort of bug he'd get over. And with Phil not able to be around as much, Kimo and Steve's civil relationship started to become strained. By June of 1997, Kimo decided to quit working for K&P because he just couldn't deal with the stress of Phil's sickness on top of working with Steve all the time. Phil's condition was also getting worse. By then, he was having trouble walking, had lost 30 pounds, and even scarier, he was starting to have memory problems. Steve told Phil, if you're sick, you can stay home and you get well. I can handle it. But while resting at home, Phil caught wind that his company allegedly wasn't paying the bills and that the money coming into the business wasn't being distributed back out to their suppliers. Phil went to the bank and found out that 10 company checks written by Steve had bounced because of insufficient funds. Well, the company not having any money was news to Phil. So he requested copies of the checks and found out his partner had been using the funds to pay for his own personal expenses, like his phone bill, military insurance, and his many shopping sprees at the local liquor store. Then Phil noticed a check made out to some company called American National for $127. And he didn't know what that was, so he gave them a call. They told him that they were a life insurance company, and Phil asked if they could tell him more about the policy Steve White held. They told him that Steve Allen White had a $100,000 life insurance policy on his business partner, Phil Rouse, that he was making monthly payments to. 
Phil paid a visit to one of the top forensic toxicologists in the US. It was probably one of the only times in history someone was excited to hear that they were being poisoned. Every time he and Steve had a meal or drink together was when his illness would flare up and he'd be immediately sick afterwards. Steve was a chemist and taught the subject at the local high school. So if anyone was gonna get their hands on some arsenic, it's this guy. When Bartlett PD heard about Phil's poisoning, along with his already ongoing financial dispute, they knew they needn't look far for their perpetrator. After a week-long trial, the jury found Steve Allen White guilty of poisoning and stealing from his business partner, Phil Rouse, and was sentenced to 31 years in prison. I don't know about you guys, but next time iTunes updates their terms of agreement and wants me to click OK, I might give that little guy a once over. You know, just in case. Welcome to Killer Bites, the show where we take you on a roller coaster of emotions while discussing the twists and turns of true crime stories. And today's story is an utterly tragic and mysterious disappearance. Today we'll be covering the case of Hannah Up. Hannah Up is or was a very special person. She was a school teacher, a traveler, and a bright beam of light to everyone that knew her. But what was so unique about Hannah in particular was that she has been missing a total of three times in her short yet colorful life. How is that possible? Let's get into it. So that is a true fact that Hannah Up has been missing multiple times throughout her life. The first two times she was thankfully found, but after going missing in 2017, no one has been able to locate her. And if you thought ending up on a missing poster three times already sounds like a wild story, the reason for each disappearance was always the same and always just as unbelievable. Hannah Up suffers from a rare form of amnesia called dissociation. Dissociative Fugue. Dissociative Fugue is a condition where a person can completely forget their name and who they are while developing a strange urge to wander or escape elsewhere. Although this might be the first time you've heard of such a thing, this phenomenon is a legitimate disorder and dozens of cases have been reported all over the world, as well as throughout history. And listen, I get it. You're sitting there thinking, how can this be real? Skeptics think it's not a real disorder or that sufferers are faking it. But while it might be difficult to wrap your head around, I ask you to just keep an open mind and just listen to Hannah's story because after you hear it, you might even be worried about developing the condition yourself. I know that's how I felt when I first heard about this case. So the first time Hannah went missing was when she was living in New York in 2008. On August 28th, the 23 year old left her apartment to go for a run and that was the last thing she remembered. Three weeks later on September 16th, Hannah was found floating face down in the New York Harbor, still wearing the athletic shorts and sports bra she'd left in. Miraculously, Hannah somehow survived, but barely, and had no idea where she'd been the past few weeks. Hannah claimed it was as if she left her apartment, blinked, and then the next thing she knew, she was being plucked out of the water with no idea how she got there. Can you imagine? Like, have you ever had surgery or been given anesthesia before? Because I feel like that's the closest thing I can relate Hannah's situation to. You're sitting there going, okay, I'm gonna see how long I could stay awake. 10, nine, eight, and then bam! Next thing you know, you're suddenly mid-conversation with a nurse named Stella who's changing your IV, saying your surgery was two hours ago. And you're like, wait, what? Hannah was going into her second year as a middle school teacher. And as far as everyone knew, there was nothing going on in her life that would have led her to leave on her own accord. In fact, she disappeared the day before the start of the new school year. She wouldn't have dreamed of causing such an inconvenience to her students and fellow staff. At first, when Hannah didn't come back from her run, everyone thought she'd been kidnapped and feared the worst. 
All of her important things, including her phone, cash, purse, and credit cards were left behind in her apartment. But when an old classmate of Hannah's spotted her nine days later at an Apple store in Manhattan, that's when the investigation took a strange turn. The classmate claimed to have seen Hannah in the Apple store wearing a sports bra and running shorts, and her hair was in a ponytail as if she'd just gone out for a run. When in reality, she had. Nine days ago. Apparently, Hannah logged into her Gmail account while she was at the Apple store, and the acquaintance approached her and was like, uh, are you the Hannah that everyone's been looking for? And Hannah was like, no, and just sort of wandered away, leaving the classmate really confused and concerned. The authorities were notified, as well as Hannah's family and friends, so literally everyone was chasing Hannah across the city, trying to catch her in places she'd allegedly been spotted, but always just a moment too late. She was spotted in a Starbucks, five different gyms, and sports clubs where she used the showers, and the Apple store. And every single time, they missed her by that much. When Hannah's mom, Barbara, watched the surveillance footage of her daughter talking with her classmate in the Apple store, she said she could tell something was off right away. They checked the computer, and it didn't seem like Hannah had read or sent any emails after logging into it, and no one, including herself, knew what she was doing in there. The interesting question people bring up here is, if Hannah forgot who she was, then how was she able to log into her email? And honestly, she can't explain it, so neither can anyone else, really. But people have, uh, how you say, theories. So a lot of people think it was kind of like a muscle memory thing. Maybe somewhere in her cerebellum, her subconscious remembered that email and login. Kind of like how she still knew how to buy herself food and get around the city while she was in this dissociated state. Maybe her hands went to the keyboard and just did what they always did. Others believe that it was Hannah somewhere deep down in there just trying to remember who she was and to come out of this confused and disoriented state. And then there's the minority that thinks she was faking it and just checking her email when she accidentally got caught. But when you hear the condition she was found in, I highly doubt you'll think she'd willingly do this to herself. After Hannah was MIA for 20 days, a Staten Island ferry driver spotted her body floating in the water south of the Statue of Liberty. Officials initially thought they were pulling out a corpse, but to their disbelief, Hannah opened her eyes and coughed up some water, and they rushed her to the hospital. She was confused, distressed, dehydrated, sunburned, and hypothermic, but she was alive. Seriously, she had hours, maybe minutes left if someone hadn't found her. But that was only the beginning of a much more confusing and bizarre story. Friends and family came to visit Hannah at the hospital, but she didn't understand at all what happened to her or where she'd been. Legit, the first thing she asked her mom was, why am I wet? She didn't seem to have any clue that three whole weeks had passed by. Police attempted to interview her, but their efforts were futile because she couldn't tell them diddly squat. The last thing she remembered was running near her apartment the day she went missing. Then she was in an ambulance. It was as if the last three weeks in her mind were just completely erased, and people were telling her all these things she'd been doing and places she had gone, but to Hannah, it felt like they were talking about a completely different person. It's almost like everything in her brain was there and working fine, but somehow one small switch in there just went boop, and whatever it was that made Hannah Hannah glitched. Like, how do you even describe it? After extensive testing and examination, Hannah was diagnosed with the rare psychological condition known as dissociative fugue. This is supposedly the type of amnesia that Jason Bourne was written to have, if you or your parents were ever into those movies. During moments of dissociation, patients will forget their identities and memories while getting that strong urge to escape. Some cases report patients fleeing countries and even continents during such episodes. Experts state the disorder is usually brought on by some form of trauma, stress, or PTSD-inducing event. But that's the thing, Hannah was like, I don't think I've suffered any trauma. Neither did her friends or family that they could recall. Like, sure, she had trauma, but not like went to Vietnam trauma or grew up in poverty trauma. Nothing that would warrant such an intense condition like this. The only stress Han and her family could think of was that she was gearing up for a new school year, 
but they didn't think that would be enough to cause the fugue state. Hannah was obviously very upset and disturbed by the whole thing, and when asked by an interviewer if she felt guilty about what she'd done, she remarked, how do you feel guilty for something you didn't even know you did? Yeah, seriously, she's like, trust me, I want to know just as badly as you do. But Hannah recovered, life went back to normal, and she and her family all did their best to put this scary ordeal behind them. Hannah was doing fine, and sure enough, months went by without an incident. Months turned into a year, and then years, and it seemed as though things were gonna be okay. In 2012, Hannah moved 200 miles away from New York and took a job as a teacher's aide at a school in Maryland. In September of 2013, the night before the first day of school, Barbara got the call that Hannah was once again missing. Hannah's purse and cell phone were found on a trail in the woods, and she apparently hadn't slept in her apartment the night before. Miraculously, Hannah was able to break out of the fugue state on her own this time. It was only two days later when Barbara answered a call from an unknown number and heard a shaky voice say, Mom, on the other end. Hannah had been walking for more than two days before she suddenly snapped out of it and came to while sitting in a dirty creek, once again with no memory of how she made her way to the water. But now they could detect that the stress of a new school year was a factor or at least one of the factors that triggered her fugue states. So they made a plan to watch Hannah's behavior more carefully around that time of year. But again, she'd had so many first day of schools before that were totally fine, where this sort of thing never happened. What gives? Hannah also hated the idea of being a liability issue and didn't want people constantly worrying about her all the time. Hannah's family members and doctors hoped that since Hannah was able to come out of it on her own this time, and only after after two days that maybe she could learn to control it or manage her stress to try to prevent it from happening again. It's not like there's a dissociative fugue for dummies manual out there, so everyone was just trying to figure it out as they went. Despite this terrifying ordeal happening twice now, Hannah was really set on living life as normal as possible. She didn't want to be watched all the time or monitored like an animal. She just wanted to be an independent adult and live her life. Hannah's doctors and her mom tried to come up with solutions about what to do if she disappeared again. And they were like, we could give you a house arrest ankle bracelet? But Hannah thought that was way over the top and she couldn't imagine trying to explain to people why she had it in the first place. She didn't like the idea of people knowing about her condition, looking at her differently, or pitying her. And I totally get that. No one wants to be a burden. But I really wish they had figured something out sooner because when Hannah unfortunately disappeared for the third time, she was never found. In September of 2017, Hannah, who was then 32, was preparing again for the start of a new school year. This time, her job led her to working on an island in the Caribbean called St. Thomas. She'd been there for around three years now and totally fit in with the island life. Hannah's friends said she was a vibrant member of the community and was involved with dancing, swimming, and Zumba while keeping up an active social life. Her best friend Maggie joked it was almost hard to be Hannah's friend because she was so high energy that she was hard to keep up with. But trouble was on the horizon when Hurricane Irma hit the island with an unrelenting ferocity. 185 mile per hour winds battered homes and decimated communities. In the days leading up to the hurricane, Maggie remembered that Hannah wasn't acting like herself. Her closest friends and co-workers on the island knew of her amnesia and were keeping an eye on her. But Hannah communicated with her friends and family throughout the duration of Hurricane Irma, letting them know she was fine, and it felt like they were in the clear, but not quite yet. A second, more powerful hurricane was headed for the island, and people were beginning to flee and take cover. Fortunately, the news about the second storm had already broken, so many people had time to get off the island if they were able to. But Hannah said she was staying where her heart was, and refused to leave her beloved home behind. On September 14th, a few days after the first hurricane, and only a few before the next, Hannah missed a staff meeting at school. She was last seen leaving her house around 8 a.m. for a swim. After that, she disappeared. Friends prayed that what they thought was happening wasn't actually happening, and ran to her favorite beach to see if she was there. 
They found Hannah's sandals, dress, and keys on the stool of a bar nearby, and the workers said they'd found the items in the sand earlier. Her car was in the parking lot with her wallet, cell phone, and passport still inside. Friends and police frantically checked the marinas, shores, hospitals, airports, homeless shelters, and morgues, but there was no trace of her. Since that day, Hannah's case has remained unsolved and no new evidence has turned up. Barbara ended up moving to St. Thomas to be closer to the search and believes that Hannah could still be out there wandering the island in a fugue state to this day. Others, unfortunately, haven't remained as hopeful. While a Facebook page dedicated to finding Hannah up was created back in 2017, the page has since become mostly inactive. With people having once referred to Hannah in the present tense on the page, they've slowly switched over to the past, indicating little hope they have of her still being alive. Some people, like Barbara, believe Hannah might still be wandering the untouched regions of St. Thomas, while others have speculated she could have taken a boat to a nearby island or Miami. But many believe in her fugue state, Hannah returned to the water where she was swept away by the strong current or lost in the hurricane. An adult skeleton washed ashore on a remote island of St. Thomas in September of 2018, but unfortunately it was so badly corroded that they weren't able to identify if it was Hannah or not. The most recent unconfirmed sighting of Hannah came in February of 2019, when a woman resembling Hannah was spotted walking the beaches of St. Croix, but there was never a follow-up, and that was the last post made to the Facebook page, at least as of fall 2021. Barbara, family, and friends won't give up hope of one day finding Hannah, and since her disappearance, several documentaries and news specials have been made about her case. While Hannah might be one of the first people you've heard of who deals with this form of amnesia, she certainly isn't the only one. It would explain some of the other mysterious disappearance we've covered on the show that just seem to make no sense. Well, that's all for this story. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.